Star League Studio. We hope you're having a good Tuesday and you have just joined us for an exciting lineup of Overwatch action. We've got a bunch of varsity teams and two teams in an open division ready to fight it out and improve their standing in the May Star League fall season. I'm your host, Jacob Jim Palmer. I am joined by Hardy Nerdy Rain to call all of the action for you tonight. Hardy, we're getting ready for our first game, which is the Astros versus Kentucky. And looking at this, Seems that these teams are very similar. They have similar win-loss records, similar ranks. So when we're looking at two teams that seem so alike, what is it that really sets one team above the other for you? It's truly it's two parts. It's understanding your win condition versus the other team's win condition 
and I, the flexibility that the two teams come to the table with, especially after a first fight win or loss, if you're looking at your composition, you know you're playing into your direct counter, or if you are, if you lose the first fight and you're playing into your counter, you need to be able to, to identify that you're on the wrong composition, make the swaps, make the adjustments quickly. If you're looking to still win the first fight, despite being on a suboptimal comp for what you're going into, always make sure that you are playing your own win condition, setting up the enemy team to be forced into those situations for yourself and your team, and play to your team's strength. So ultimately, if we see a team that's, you know, trying to fit a round peg into a square hole continually, that's probably the team that's gonna struggle the most. Yeah, I've seen a lot of teams get tunnel vision and be allured by that ever-increasing ultimate charge number when it's just not working out for them. But hopefully these teams find what's working for them. And let's take a look at the schedule. I teased the first match that we had. It is Ashland University versus Kentucky. Then we'll move on to St. Clair from up north in Canada versus Ferris State. And our last two games of the evening are going to be between West Texas A&M, UT Dallas, and then we're going to have University of San Francisco taking on UNLV. And that last game is the open division match that we had. Last week, we had a really fun open division uh, match. That was the only one that wasn't a sweep. It was back and forth. We had some great flashpoint play. So I'm looking forward to this week's open division match as well. But let's start with Ashland versus Kentucky and take a look at what both of these schools have to bring to the table in terms of their players. We've got Memes, B1H, Max Dub Speed, Ravala, and Vasuki for Ashland. For the side of Kentucky eSports, we're going to have Mad Jack, Butters, Despacito, Clario, and Andy running out that roster. So these two teams are ready to load right in. We are going to be starting out on control, and then we're going to be moving on to hybrid, then flashpoint. Uh, a lot of teams decided to kind of play it out of order last week, but it is supposed to be going control, uh, hybrid, and then flashpoint. So we're guaranteed to see the new mode, or should be for most of these matches. Yeah, so this is proven in a lot of situations leading up till now to be a double-edged sword for some teams, this new lineup of maps, because there are some teams that are absolutely ex excellent at escort. However, if they struggle on the other maps and they plan to use escort kind of as their opportunity to bring things back in their favor, because it used to be third map type, that's when you can start with a reverse sweep. But now it's flashpoint. So if you struggle on control points, odds are you're also going to struggle with flashpoint because it's control but on steroids. So hopefully teams are able to work around the differences in map types that they're going to be seek, uh, running into tonight and have actually scrimmed both New Drug City and Servasa and are ready to go on them tonight. You kind of have the opening of the well-known stages, you know, the control stages. A lot of them have been around since the beginning of the game. And then, of course, you have hybrid, which is usually Keen's Row, so talk about something that a lot of teams know in and out. But then we move on to Flashpoint. So it's kind of like a sudden right-angle turn in terms of just how used to everything everyone is. Well, also the old order used to be, so you went from a control, and then you went to hybrid, which has a control point, and then an escort point. And then you would move over to escort. So you kind of braced yourself transitioning from, in the, from control all the way to just pushing a payload for the third map type. But now you're yo-yoing. You're going to go from control to a control escort and then into a control. So the ability to adapt, identify win conditions, and change your play style for all three of those maps is going to be really important. Well, we're going to be ready to jump into the game very soon. Once again, this is Ashland versus Kentucky and the first game of our varsity lineup for the Tuesday Overwatch schedule. And we'll be moving on with two more varsity matches and finally that open game that I was talking about. So as we're ready to jump into the first control stage, we saw a lot of Lee Jean last week. Uh, that seems to be kind of a definite opening, but I got to tell you, if there's one stage that I root for, it's Nepal only for Sanctum because I'm just <sighs> I'm such a sucker for environmentals. I it's completely valid. I get it. I mean, if you look at it, I've my history, a lot of these teams' histories were Lucio players on main support for all of Overwatch 2. You love Nepal, but they're the same token. It's like, if I don't get this environmental, how much grief is my team going to give that me? That is true. So with that being said, yes, I love Nepal, but I also hate to be on the receiving end of being in an mm. environmental death. So, you know, I would like to see a deviation away from Li Zhang, maybe give some love over to, love over to Busan. However, Elios is also in that mix, so there's another opportunity for environmentals if you want to make sure that box is ticked. Yeah, it is ticked. It's just not as severe as it is on Sanctum because, oh my goodness, you could really make a you could re really make kind of an April Fool's map out of that if you really wanted to go all out on bottomless pits. But we won't get into that right now. We are just going to wait for these teams to load in, and then we'll find out what the first stage in and is, and move on from there. 
And as we're talking just about control stages, uh, we kind of alluded to it a little bit earlier. Some of them are, you know, I, it's like I don't care too much for the other maps on Nepal just in terms of your entertainment value. For pure entertainment value, okay? You know. I like well for pure entertainment value, but that's Elios. I mean, Sanctum, I get the pure entertainment <laughs> as well, but we're going to go to Li Zhang, and if you're looking for the entertainment of Lucio players, well, then definitely. Gardens. Yes, Gardens 100%. Has a history of being boop city because people don't, uh, you know, understand. There's a Lucio who's hiding on the wall. There's a Farah. There is sometimes an Orisa spear. There's a hog with a hook, all of which can lead to your doom off the edge of the bridge. Also through the window if you decide to TP into the window, which is why you'll always hear me cry to TP on the platform to the left of the window or to the right of the window, depending which side of you are attacking gardens from. Night Market notorious for always having the sim TP and brawl on point. However. There is some wiggle room with regarding compositions, especially if you lose that first fight, make sure you're able to swap off and understand the win condition of your team when you're preparing for your second engage on that map. What's interesting is uh, last week, we actually saw two teams go uh, for the Symmetra teleport play to open up on, on Li Zhang, but those were not the teams that held the point in the end. Where it used to be, you just always kind of see a dueling Symmetra teleport race. I, the teams sometimes do struggle to understand what they need to do with their symmetric composition when they're going into a team that is not Brawl. Because there are some teams who are just, you know, Brawl is the plague. They're not going to touch it. They know most teams are going to want to go Brawl. That's fine. They're going to play around it. Therefore, if your team is going to say, we are going to take this point, we're going to sim TP there, and we're going to rely on getting our Symmetra beam charge up, but the other team is not coming towards you, you're going to have a problem. You need to adapt. You need to get more mobile. Use your Symmetra Teleporter to get off the point. Get someone out of rotation. Don't just sit there. That is the biggest problem. I don't care if you're a ball comp. Yes, you play as a ball, but you still have movement. You just have to use it properly. No, and, and if you got a skilled Wrecking Ball player, I mean, they are flying all over the place. It's hard to keep track of them. Probably one of the most mobile tanks that there is. But it's all up in the air as to what these two teams for. They both have two zero records. I was saying that they had similar win-loss records. Those are the records that they had. Uh, I believe as we're looking, the Eagles, the Eagles for Ashland faced off against St. Xavier and RIT. And then Kentucky faced off against Old Miss and Edgewood. Yeah, and in the case of the Eagles taking on RIT, they 3-1, still end up being victorious. And Edgewood going up against the Wildcats, they 3-1 in the other two games. Both teams got a 3-0 sweep. So something went wrong on one map. Not entirely sure what that was, but obviously they managed to overcome the issues they were experiencing, fix the problem, and move forward. So if both these teams can identify when problems are happening, fix it, but it took an entire map, that could be a problem in this series because sometimes one map is all it takes to be the end-all, be-all deciding factor. Ready to load into the first map. Just having to work out a few tech issues right now, and that's no surprise to anyone really sometimes you just get internet issues and uh battle net doing battle net things so overall we're just chilling right here gem and nerdy ready to start off this first match ashland university versus kentucky when we get all the issues ironed out so we've talked a lot about what what a team needs to kind of do on night market after that they teleport in we also touched on the various environmentals that Garden, as we can see here, uh, uh, that Garden offers. But what about the third? What about a command center? What, what do you think uh, is the main thing that teams are going to have to pick up as they move into that? Uh, making sure you get your Symmetra teleporter out quickly and everyone takes it. There's been too many times where I've seen plays uh, teams either miss the teleporter because someone decides that they are going to actually use their movement ability as opposed to taking team TP. Or in other instances, it's a matter of not claiming space when you need to. And if we're looking at these, uh, this one over here is control center. Are we? Yeah, OK. So this is control center. Lots of times when we see teams come out of spawn, you're going to TP, amp speed, and both teams will meet at this location and that location uh, with respect to one another at the exact same time. It's when they get here around server room that things really start to go wrong. And what I'm saying is you'll have a team that either decides to play from their choke point and tell the other team to come to them, or they actually push up to the other team's doorway. It's claiming that space to the other team's doorway that's really important. And the way I always tell uh, players apart and the ones that know what they're doing versus the ones that are struggling is a team will take space, not using cooldowns, 
and they'll back off when the enemy team starts using cooldowns. It's like, you have to pay me a toll fee to get me to back off. If you're willing to give up a cooldown, I will give the space. But if you're giving up space, you still hang on to your cooldown, and then you're able to walk back up with your own and take it back. But it's the teams that either A, overstay their welcome in that location because teams are using cooldowns and their backline's getting deleted if you're a tank, or B, the ones that just play back and let the other team come forward without paying anything whatsoever that really starts running the problems. Also, last week we saw an amazing play by uh, a Doomfist tank. Uh, someone tried to set up their Symmetra teleport right there. The Doomfist just turned around from the second floor above server room and just punched all the way across point and knocked them off for an environmental. Well, the fun part is that uh, Control Center is the notorious 1v1 map that a lot of players like to use to warm up. And one of the few tanks you'll end up playing is Doomfist. And so you better know your Doomfist parkour. And whatever players typically are on it that I know, I always hear, I'm going to get that parkour, get that parkour. Because <laughs> you can tech off the middle portion of the map inside the control point itself. And any map Doomfist that actually has spent time on Doom knows how to get the environmentals. And you see someone on an edge, you're like, oh, you're going you're gonna to enjoy this nice little swim here for a bit. And regret your life choices because if there's a doomfist just don't stand on the edge well, i beg of you like don't you're like putting a giant x on yourself well if we talk about swimming i mean we're, we got gardens where you can literally swim with the fishes if you just go for that risky if you put that teleporter right up there we've seen so many lucios just waiting in that window to make the whole team just take a take a uh Take a sip of fresh water, I suppose. Yes, and it was on the highlight reel for Nace that one of the Lucio players, in fact, you know, did the standard rollout. You glide ac across this middle pillar, you hit the building, you come through, hit this wall, go through the middle of the point, and you make it to the window by the time the enemy sim TP pops up. However, the way to circumvent that as the Symmetra TP player is you place it here or you place it here. However, if a team predicts that, be careful, don't walk too forward too fast because if an Orisa is also posted here because they dropped the same TP, you're gonna get spear spun or speared off the map. So be weary of the cooldowns of what you're going up against and don't always just walk forward with no information. <laughs> it's also very comp dependent because if you've got a, a very good farmer, so you just catching the air, you've got this whole left side of the stage that is just a no-go. I mean, you can try to push across the bridges if you want, but she's just going to yell get back at you and you could fall uh, into the crevice as well so you know the right side really comes into play if you've got a really oppressive far mercy or even an echo up there i mean the pharmacy can be a little bit of a problem sometimes it's when a team sees the pharmacy doesn't mm -hmm. wait for the boop and goes forward anyway however if your team is frontline and backline communicating your backline goes no boop or your frontline says far use boop then you move forward, you're totally fine. And the other issue is that a lot of teams will dump too many resources into the pharmacy. She's not that much of a threat. Mm -hmm. You look at the Mercy, give her a couple of love shots, she's gonna have to hide. Farah can't take as much space because Mercy can't stay with her in that instance. And then you focus on everybody else. Once you get those picks and elimination, then you can turn your focus to the pharmacy. Just please don't let a Farah sit above your head and shoot at you because you're like, oh, you can't do much to me. Yes, they can if you don't pay attention to them. Just don't give all of your attention to them. You don't the care how much you're a Reaper or Junkrat main, you need to adapt to the situation at hand. Most definitely. And then as we're looking toward Night Market way over here, we already talked about Symmetra Teleport that can happen as both teams are trying to move their way into the point. But you were also talking about just these side areas here, these flanks. You really got to make sure that you watch them and not just sit after you've teleported. Yeah, so once your team gets on, if theoretically, if both teams play it perfectly, they get on the exact same time. But if one team beats the other team there first and they're running May, you drop the May wall up on the enemy sim TP and it breaks. So only half the team makes it through or one or two players don't make it through. Then you clean up what's on point. However, once you are secured and anchored on point, before the cap even starts, you need to figure out who's watching the left lane, who's watching the right lane. Because as soon as an enemy team makes a swap or someone decides to break off and pull attention from one of these angles, either a, one of your DPS or one of your squishies, if they can't take that duel, they don't see it coming, they are going to get deleted and that is a huge problem. So you need to watch your lanes and understand what your wind condition is in those instances. Typically, it's get your Symmetra beam charge up, but don't just sit on point. Find where they're going, place a teleporter, either bait their attention or take the TP and delete them from behind. If a team's feeling really confident, sometimes we just see them moving all the way up to the choke and not even letting the team get the opportunity to choose left or right lane. So now we are waiting to see what the first of three stages that we have provided extensive coverage of. These teams are going to load up. And from the music swelling, I believe we're starting out on command center. 
And once uh, I also want to say shout out to production for providing this uh, very cool video wall for us to use. Uh, you know, true professional just to do that. But here we go. Ashland University versus Kentucky, match one. Let's take a look at what both these teams are bringing to the table. See, as far as the blue team is concerned, which I believe is Ashland, we are seeing uh, and listen uh, uh, and uh, that's just yeah, that is the war of attrition comp that I have touched on briefly. Typically, you run a Bash, you can run a Tracer or Ash or Torbjorn as the second DPS. The Orisa, Lucio, Baptiste, or Orisa, Baptiste, and Iari, but it looks like they've chosen to go with the Lucio and they're using Tim variant to allow for extra mobility. We see Clario is going to be the first one to lead to the planet Kentucky, who is running a competition centered around the Zarya. Typically in the past, you know, Zarya got it was a counter for Orisa, but when there's so much damage, it makes it really difficult for players like Reaper that are slower to survive. At the University off of that one kick, Madjack also taking a whole bunch of damage. He doesn't manage to find his way out of there, but we are seeing a bunch of burst potential from Ashland as they also got Clario on the road. So he's going to heal up as so he moves as a team to test the point. Immortality field is going to be rocked. It is shut down pretty fast. Javelin's going to go out. Clario once again low on health, but Andy mm -hmm. eliminates Basuki off the edge. We also see Max go. That should be a team fight win for Kentucky to make this game. Yeah, I'm going to Max. Don't, don't sit up there. I know I said if there's a Doom Fest, don't go over there, but the same thing applies if there's a Lucio. Any Lucio with their salt that's full health to the Bastion, who has no turret form, is gonna run after you and boop you off the map. The only exception is really tanks, because tanks have a passive ability that makes it harder for Lucio to boop them, and doesn't so nearly as far. Ooh. Okay, I guess the uh, strategy for Orisa is press W to burn bubbles, because that Zarya's high charge, he gets dropped the counter, Butter is going to take out the Immortality, but Reaper comes in, takes out a Torture, as well as the Immortality, both for Ashland University going down. Good news that Ashland can walk away from this, even if they don't take the point this time, they at least traded two Ultimates for three, Kentucky has used everything. Now they're contesting the point, Despacito gets the pick under Rev. Ashland University perfect for one, and their Torbjorn is trying to eliminate. He gets taken out, as well as B1. He's going to be a send back toward Ashland. Oh, yeah, this next fight, we have Baptiste close to that ultimate. Sorry, they just use grabs about this percent there. But what I really want to look at is for Ashland, they have this amplification matrix plus the Torbjorn ultimate. Okay, right by the time they cross this archway, the this front doorway, and get down this hall, they should have them. This Ant Matrix, if they round this corner and put it in the correct spot, swing wide with it, just like that, they can lock down it in the entire point and make it extremely difficult for the enemies to stay alive. Well, Kentucky hasn't taken too much damage from it. They're going to place down their own Amp Matrix and get the first pick onto Max. Means does manage to take out Clario, but the eliminations are piling up against Ashland. As Kentucky, uh, we see it that <laughs> Molten Core used to try to turn things around, but the fight's already over, an unfortunate use on that ultimate. And now, only at best one team fight left for Ashland. Tragically, if that Torbolt had been popped as soon as the enemy amp matrix went out, Ashland would have stood a much better chance because that one ult put them ahead by one. We do see grab is used early to keep people off the point from Andy. Now we're gonna use Wall to secure an entire half where the side of Ashland has to walk into the danger zone in order to get damage done to the back line. It is do or die for Ashland. Have swapped over to the soldier a little while ago. Yeah, right now they're trying to do their best to stay on point, put a bit of damage on their tank. Also catch out the soldier who's trying to run away, but he just can't. The Cito picks up a double, teleports over now as the Lucio in their sights, as well as the Death Blossom is just going to tear right through Ashland. Yet a team wipe, a win, flashy style. Score. We can take a quick look here at this symmetric Ready play. First finds the Soldier 76. Not positive Soldier. Yeah, Soldier did use their healing pad, unfortunately. So Symmetra read this one like a book, said, ah, no, you can't survive this. Again, this is the full beam on Soldier Teleports. Takes care of the Lucio and helps out with the Zarya. That is utilizing those teleporters to the fullest extent, not just staying on one spot. Now, this is the Notorious. Who executes the same composition better? It is all about timing. 
And truthfully, I think the difference maker here is which team has everybody pressed up against the door and hitting W out the gate versus the team that does not. The overlay will go up. We see the race, and both of them seem pretty even in making it towards the point, although Ashland has decided to set their Bastion up in the window. Mortality Field is going to bail out Kentucky, but a lot of Ashland is very low. Cal Clario finding themselves pressured, but is still managing to hang in there as both teams burn through their lanterns. First pick is going to be courtesy of Max taking Clario. Zarya shortly thereafter falls on the side of Ashland and Memes, so that should be a turnaround in favor of Kentucky despite losing Clario early on. They will get the full team wipe and point in their favor. Clario, it's one thing to be in the back pocket of your Zarya, it's another thing to be in front of your Zarya. Just be careful, it's very important that you survive because Zarya needs your extra damage. So we do see the JQ swap on the side of Ashland University and Memes dies instantly. To Andy, now that's the go button for everyone here on the side of Kentucky to claim extra space and force back to enemy team for a little bit longer. It isn't just in jungle between the swap the entire DPS section for Ashland. Swapped out for a soldier and Genji. Where's the Kuriko being brought out? So you could technically have three DPSs if that Kuriko can land a shot. We're seeing Graphton Surge be brought out by Kentucky, forcing all of this damage right onto Ashland. B1 and Means fall as a result. The rest are soon after. Once again, Ashland set back to start. Going into this next fight, we're going to have Rampage online. Kitsune Rush very close. Beat and Blade all on the side of Ashland. And for the side of Kentucky, they're going to have that Death Loss and Beat as well as Amplification Matrix. So about equal as far as the ultimates go. It's just the only concern I have is how does the side of Ashley plan to get in here if they use Kitsune Rush too early. They decide to go over on coastline, almost getting moved off, so that comes to clutch. Reaper looking for Death Blossom, does get eliminated. Rivali goes down for the side of Ashley University. Beat is used to help stabilize our attacking squad right now. Genji has Blade, but is getting harassed by Lucio, and unfortunately Means goes down for Ashley University. Oh, brings out the blade, but the Lucio bubble. Thanks to Andy, that just charges that Zarya right up. She tears through two, and a death blossom also helps Kentucky keep control of the point. That was just tragic. That's a Genji It is, but with the Zarya changes, bubbles come online faster. They're bigger. Your team really needs to help force them if you're looking to get value from the blade and not just try to burn abilities. But obviously, that was a attempt of hero play, attempt of equalizer. So those bubbles being alive mean get, meant that the Genji blade was for naught. Now it's just get a touch on point, try to get a toe on there. Anybody's looking, and it looks like no one from Ashland University will be able to survive. Kentucky's going to walk away with a map one win on the Zhang. Two to zero, picking up that win pretty early. We'll see what the play of the game is as far as the game is concerned. It is going to be going over to Despacito. Map one is symmetric play? No, it's the map two is in play. Okay, nicely done, Despacito. Charging that beam up and holding down the left mouse button to win, which is my favorite type of game. I am playing. I'm a Symmetra enjoyer. I don't care how much people hate her. There's like, I know people hate A. I know he, people hate Sim. I know he, people hate Sombra. I love playing Symmetra when I'm playing DPS because I can't aim. So I commend anyone that can get Symmetra and play her properly. Additionally, I know people hate other supports, but uh, at the end of the day, supports are supports. What can you do about it? Well, I wasn't saying that as a point of derision. I was saying that as you've played a little bit of pa Paladins, I play a lot of Vivian, okay? So oh, okay. I like that kind of just, I'm holding down the left mouse button, pushing as much damage as I can out to you. So I wasn't being hostile at all. <laughs> I was saying, hey, I'm, I'm with you. Yes, it is the, I am undeterred by any damage you throw at me, I have a beam. Mm -hmm. My uh, personal favorite is when I see a Genji try to deflect either a Zarya beam or a Sim beam, and I sit there and I laugh. <laughs> One thing we're not going to laugh about, however, is King's Row, which has been, in fact, chosen for hybrid, which, hey, it's a classic stage, but it is the go-to stage as far as Overwatch is concerned. You could go Eichenwald. You, you could go... Blizzard World, just two other options outside of King's Row. You can go to Mani. I was, you know, that was another reason why we enjoyed the open match so much, because they did choose Eichenwald and changed it all up. I so. get it. We get it. But we're going to complain. Get more creative. Stop going to King's Row. Everyone practices it.
practice a different map. If you don't think you'll win control, practice a different map. Don't go to Kings. Everyone has played this game, this one to death. Go pick a different one. Make it harder for the other team to be successful. Be the expert at a different hybrid other than Kings. I beg of you. With that being said, let's get to Kings Row. Ah. All righty. So we got three main stages of Kings Row. Now we're taking a look over the Omnic Factory, but what stage do you usually look to? It normally ends in the Omnic Factory. It seems like uh, the streets are normally just passed over pretty easily. I actually think streets can be a tell-all for how well a team's going to perform because I, I said it last week, Kings Row is an all-or-nothing type map. We either see everything or we don't see anything at all, and we stay on point one. Now, if both teams are going to cap point one, it's if the team struggles in streets phase. If it's the defending team that's struggling in streets phase, doesn't manage to stall out the payload progression whatsoever, they're going to have a hard time if we end up going into overtime. If the other team on attack struggles to actually push the payload through streets phase, either it be they are poorly positioning, they aren't claiming space, they're staying in positions for too long, well, that is going to be a telltale sign of how things are going to progress when we go into overtime. So ultimately, I think street space is the most telling, but at the end of the day, it's going to be up to these two teams to tell us ultimately who's better on King's Row. It's also a chance for those Widowmaker mains to flex their muscles, taking that early peek out of the window just to put your team at a one-person advantage for the first fight. Never a bad thing. And we can see from our defending squad, I believe. Yeah, we're going to have a Reaper Brawl yet again for Symmetra Zarya. Simter placed up pretty far. Lucio did not pay attention and take them out. Reaper already forced Wraith. That is that is a go to meet the Reaper. Yes, that is capitalizing on someone using cooldown poorly, forcing the enemy team back. Means Kentucky has to rotate into Hotel, play a little safe, but this is, again, you're staying on the point. You're not pushing forward, forcing cooldowns. You're letting them come back and say, please, we do see both Zaryas get one kill apiece. The question is, which support goes down next? It's Lucio for the side of Kentucky. And losing a Lucio in a brawl comp makes things rough. National University captures the point on their first push. They have plenty of time to push that hay payload now. And opportunity, like you were saying, nerdy. <laughs> and just the eliminations keep on coming for Ashland, putting a stagger on to Kentucky. Not bad at all. But like you were saying, Nerdy, we're going to see how much trouble uh, Ashland has as they push through streets. And judging by that first mm. fight, it might not be too much. This is a little concerning, though, because who's typically the payload pusher, the one player that always gets to take selfies when they're playing Overwatch? It's typically your Lucio. Reason is because, you know, Lucio is speed. You can get back to the fight as needed. But not having your Bastion with you in this fight lowers your damage output. Your highest amount of damage is gone. So instead of claiming this corner and keeping the team back, they're forcing a fight at this corner. And that's both B and Window expunged to Kentucky to guarantee that they have this area. And they use B too soon because Grav is still online for Ashland University. Jackie just tears right through Ashland with a triple. They're gonna pick up just one more. Turret has someone, which I'm sure Tord actually does. Now Tor himself is gone and out of the picture. He is going to lose their first fight. This archway is the bane of many players' existence. Why claiming the space in front of library, putting the enemy to back is very important. Because if you are pushed back to this archway, it is hard to get past it. But once again, we have people giving up a lot of space. So archway was claimed without spending anything. There is an ant matrix in the corner, this one street lit way, very short. They just back off, wait a few moments, no ground to lose, but lost. We do see Kentucky has come forward, they get caught in a grab, Ooh. and the core ultimate bolt four comes through. That is a team point for Ashland University. This is why you don't aggressive Lucio. Kentucky isn't gonna have, I have red. Kentucky oh. is gonna have Lucio beat one more time, actually. I, yeah, I thought they had beat it in that sense, but they did not have it yet. We also see Overclock very close for Kentucky. They're going to get one more engage with the Barrage coming in. Oh. They move out of the way, although that Torb does take a bit of damage, taking out the Immortality Field of Kentucky right now. He also expunged from Ashland. They move on to point. Bap is able to pick up Clario. Butter is also low on health. Eliminated Despacito is trying to bring this back with the Overclock, but it is no, it doesn't do the job when after your team is down. Ashland University 
Mercy is nailing through. I mean, Street Space is done. We're at the Omnic Factory. And that's why I said people, t the team's going to struggle if at all on a map it's going to be during Street Space. Now, we don't see a whole lot of swaps from the side of Kentucky as far as defense goes. I mean, yes, Sojourn and Bapki get the high ground. Iyari, if you do it right, can get on high ground as well. But loot the uh, Bastion and have no choice but to fight. Fight down main and take angles. We'll have to see how much of a difficulty the other people being on high ground proves for Ashlyn. So far, no one's gone down. And you see that the Bastion checks their way up onto the high right. Molten Cora expunged for Ashlyn. They move in further, but it seems like that Bastion is just right in the middle of all the lava, singing happily like he's in the eye of the storm. He is taken out, however, by Max Vesuki. Takes out Butters and Kentucky. Enough of them are gone. Despacio's the only one left. He falls. And this is going to be the end of Ashland's push. Pretty healthy overtime amount. Over three minutes and 30 seconds. Nicely done from Ashland. And I got to give my shout out to Bastion. Score. Post taking Three, different two, checkpoints. Switch I mean, the number one DPS player in the world in uh, North America right now is a Bastion One Trick. So, hats off to anyone that is able to do it themselves. Initiating match. This was oh, I just we just saw a flashback. It, you know, if we didn't see it right there, we're gonna see it in play of the game. <laughs> we know what the play of the oh, game yeah. has to be. That's horrible. Beyond a shadow of a doubt. If it's not, I'm gonna be shook. However, if something absolutely incredible happens here. I will happily tip my hat to that person and say, okay, that could be it, but it, it has to be incredible. No, someone's going to pick Hanzo, get one pick in the air, and the game's going to say, that's a sharpshooter. Play of the game. Not just that, you're going to Ajax the Lucio in that moment. <laughs> so you get ult cancel plus sharpshooter, instant play of the game. Goodbye, Torbjorn Ultimate, even though you got a 5k. Looks like running the double turret strategy again with the Torbjorn Bastion. I love it. Hopefully they're not punished too heavily for all being on low ground to start. <laughs> I do believe we're already seeing the Ashland University choosing that widow, so could be easy pickings as soon as those doors open. I do see this competition run where everyone stacks up, plays it more as a brawl comp, but this competition what? does offer versatility and can take advantage of the high ground from the beginning as a defense. And starting on low, you can't adjust to the high ground without it being fights, whereas if you're starting from high, transitioning to low, mid-fight, means you don't have to either spend a lot of time out of fight to do the rotation or a cooldown to do that rotation. So let's help Ashlyn not get punished for all the choosing to be followed up around Mandata statue as Masuki is the first one to go down for the side Ashlyn University. Oh, that Reaper had that Lucio in his sights, but Zarya was just gonna say no to that one. Sorry, it's charged up. B1 is putting so much damage. Basically seeing a lightsaber duel right now play out between these two Zaryas. Stop popping the Zaryas bubbles when their supports are still alive, please. Both these Zaryas are just high charge. Please, look at someone else. I guess this is the biggest person in the room. But look at Lucio, look at the map. Stop just charging her off cooldown. We see Glario goes down though for Kentucky. That Reaper comes in and rates out real fast, is getting punished quite frequently. Well, after the battle of the dueling Zarya's, I put my sunglasses on and been able to see through all the particle effects. So I should be good, but with that window set up, that bastion, that is just a no-go zone for the next few seconds. Kentucky waits it out, places down their own window, and moves on toward the point. Ashland is sitting on a beach should they need it. With Mad Jack going, they are off to a good start. They decide to use the beach. Also, Molten Core has come online for Ashland. But uh, Lucio, Vesuvia, and Rivali all managed to get in and pick oh! up one. Uh, wow. I thought he got away. I thought Mad, Mad Jack, theoretically, technically by the math, just died twice in the fight and didn't get rezzed. Yikes. Ducky moves around to the old college try yet again, but they have to <laughs> deal with a molten core. <laughs> again and it the try did not work out they lose two lose three i think this is you might make it out alive but andy does not nah, i mean we thought the lucio would make it out alive 
Our predictions just fell flat yet again. Kentucky is starting to build up resources, however. They got the overclock and they got a beat online, but nothing much else. Ashland has one barrage in the window and Graviton Surge pretty soon on Mark. E1 almost has the grab online. Uh, so Mad Drag hopefully hangs on to this beat and maybe Nazaria has grab, does not be aggressive. But we'll have to wait and see. It looks like Means and Andy are pretty equal, so Means likely again. He's gonna just be waiting it out for that Zarya Grab Hunter. Like Means has been doing the majority of this game so far. This ends now. Okay, Graviton Surge be brought out as well as Overclock and D to stick it out through that Graviton Surge. With less than a minute on the clock, Kentucky has picked up their second pick with the Zarya's popped her bubble and is charged up even more right now. Takes out Clario. Ash University also being kept alive by that immortality field. The Zarya's are fighting again! My eyes where's, can only take so much. Where's the duel of the fate? Like I need that as a button right now with the current Zarya, with the current Zarya meta, because it is like a Sith Lord and a Jedi Master facing it off when the beams are at full charge. That group was only able to get those second checks. With only 15 seconds left, I don't think they even have enough time. They're gonna have to Torp, turn the Lucio up and just, just book it. it. Make the carpet. Give them the red carpet. Yep, you can't come in unless you want to walk through the lava. Zarya does manage to make it on point, but everyone else is caught out by the paparazzi walking down the red carpet. And that is it. Ashland University. All right, we're tied one aside. Now we move on to Flashpoint. Let's see, let's see the play of the game first. Like we said, it's probably the Torb Zarya combo. Yep, Torb, you are getting play of the game with the five, 5K during Streets phase, first attack. Yep. Jacob, I'm pretty sure you're not shocked. No, I, I am not shocked. I'm not shocked either. See, sometimes we do predict things right. I'm just glad, yeah, that the obvious play actually was picked. I'm happy as far as that is concerned. But you hinted at something very early on in the broadcast, which might actually be playing out before us right now. And that is kind of the difference. Maybe a team's better at more of the controlly play style, while another's good at the escort sort of play style. And... We're going to be heading back to Flashpoint now, the control of controls. Yes, and the most anxiety-inducing and frustrating version of them all, because whereas on Control Point, you can basically guarantee you can get about three to four solid fights on any sub-map of a Control Point. With these maps, you get like two, maybe two and a half if you're lucky. If your team staggers too much and you're not the one in control of the point, good luck, you're going to probably only get two fights. And what stage of the two do you think we're going to be seeing? Probably New Junk City. I have just, based off experience so far, most teams seem to, seem to favor it. I don't blame them. Servasa, one of the control points, one of the, sorry, apologies, flash points, um, will send <laughs> a lot of players into the drink accidentally is the only way I can put it. Like, the way it's built, there's um, walkways leading up to it, and there are, like, four different areas that people can fall off of or get booped off of, and it is a pain. Whereas New Jack City only has really one of those, and it's, you know, it's a coastline. It's really obvious. Whereas Cervasa, my first pug on it, I walked off and I was like, oh, there's a hole. That was not fun. And I am going to eat crows right now. We are going to Cervasa. Good news about Flashpoint is, though, is Lucio's so never felt more appreciated for how much you have to book it between points. It's it can be anywhere from like 108 to 140 meters to walk from spawn to flashpoint or flashpoint to flashpoint. You bet you need a Lucio or a Symmetra or a combination of Lucio, Symmetra, and a JQ to feel like you're actually making progress towards the objective. Of course, every game of Flashpoint is different because you never know what the game is going to randomly choose for you. For well, the next. Yes. But I am starting to believe that actually in the predetermined four, order, there's only like two three, variations of the two, order. That's one, just my own opinion. I have yet to Well, it's random chance then on which of those two variations yeah, it's chosen. It's a coin flip. You got a 50 play. 50 between those two. But I'm pretty sure there's actually a designated like order of the maps based off of whichever map, uh, whichever plot point is set. I'm just convinced of that because of how mundane and everything is on the field, but that's because I play too much of the one. First time that we've seen the Alari be brought out by Kentucky, and it's not going to be out for long. Yikes! Yeah. Mm. I love War of Attrition, but if you're playing a 
JQ, Luzu, Kiko, and Genji all against the Yari. Yari, we are not going to have to. Suki takes out the turret. This Macedo Sicken is going to be on the turret this time. Kentucky is going to try to charge the first charge of the flash point. Despite losing their Yari, they did a great job. I mean, Baptiste does a grotesque amount of heals. Corp can also self heal theoretically. With the overload, Orisa's Fortify gives extra shields. Soldier has a healing pad. So going down one support when you have all of those abilities in your back pocket is totally fine. It is, that, this is why it's, you know, war of attrition. There's so much to stain if this is a mirrored composition on both sides. Question is with B1H now moving back over to the Zarya. How high is that charge going to get? We've already taken a good bit of damage. Turret is eliminated. One H moves on to the point of the test. Kentucky is 80% towards capture red. Despacito gets eliminated. As Clario. At this point, losing one DPS might be a bit more impactful for Kentucky than losing one for Suki eliminates Mad Jack. Max also got eliminated and managed to help back his way back up. B1H takes out Andy. With the tank on, that is for sure. Ashland is now going to be moving in to contest this point. Kentucky waited way too long to figure out whether or not they needed to get out that fight and just die or you know, actually fight for it. They had lost the objective and now we're at 50%. So by the time everybody has made it back, we're verging on last fight territory. It's end all be all, whichever team wins. Fight is going to take this objective. We'll have to wait and see. We are getting close to the very powerful ultimates in the form of Graviton Hunter, as well as Captain Sun in online society. They have the combo almost. Well, 1% off of Mad Jack and Captain Sun, who don't get a season in Tori and something to come out. Grav is going to be used on the Andy shortly after getting that terror surge. Taki tries to cap back the point they're successful in that endeavor by a wide margin now no time for ashland to get back the first flash point done flash point temple temple is announced as the next flash point and bucky already looking their way over towards it. with a whole lot in their pocket as well captain sun visor a lot of damage they can put out. And we do hear the first one to go is going to be Mad Jack's Cap the Sun. I don't think it's landed on anybody, which is magic. It's going to be beat from me on Ashley to beat Rest Forward. Find Clario, who spent a little bit. The station is a little too far forward. The station is pretty good because he got eliminated. We have a soldier visor popped on coastline. Got saved by the railing. I thought you were gonna go into the drink. But tragically, again, just no one's looking, no one's in the position where that soldier was looking, so it's an almost four-nothing ultimate. Ooh. Well, yeah, I'm sorry. The Cito, though, is gonna get payback for his fall and teammate. Window drop. <laughs> That's a lot of damage. thing is, they still have more damage that they can push out. They've got that visor, and the Ilaria is already more than halfway to charging up another captive sun, so a mulligan. I don't really... That had to genuinely be a miss, because the only, there's only one person that can get rid of captive sun, like the spot from captive sun, and that's, you know, he won. Sorry, it's bubbles. Well, so that must have been either a miss or both bubbles were used. You cannot keep space off of it. One bubble gets burned. Ooh. We're gonna visor with amp speed, go in, Terra Surge. Oh. Zarya goes low, uses grab as a last ditch effort, but everyone had ran away from the only children. Do not blame them. Oh, soldier! Oh. Soldier, I have so many questions. Why didn't you just they had a very bad time too. They're crossing 80%, which means Ashland University. I don't know if they can make it back as a full team. We're down to 90, and Lucio's taking a lot of damage already from the turret. They're gonna barely make it over. Uh, Lucio 
does not make it oh, off. Oh no. So she got pooped off. They didn't make it in time. No. Captain Sun is burned. Horrible damage is also used that multiple. Captain Sun gets two. Despacito goes down to Revalia. Now Kentucky's just rotating away as they have gotten the staggers. And they're looking to go get the third point. Kentucky also, they're doing this without the loose and she boost as well. And they, they're still booking it pretty, pretty far, but Ashland with that Lucio speed boost looks like they're going to get there first. So we have a pause be brought out, unfortunately. But, as we said, you never know how internet can be. I mean, right now, from my perspective, I'm not going to throw out any names of internet companies, but if my YouTube is buffering at home, I'm having a problem. And that was me last night. So, I definitely understand anyone having internet connection problems. You have a cat sometimes you like to shoot and that also happens. The university gets to the point first. It's going to get the charge going and throw down the window. Kentucky throws down theirs as well. So, Mario's just kind of going to duck back around the corner and wait those windows out. Multi four now popped by Ashland. Uh, by Kentucky, excuse me. Ashland University is going to use the beat. Now, Multi four instead. And the Terra Surge as well takes out well, Mad Jack's pylon. And all they're gonna be happy with. Meanwhile, the other characters in Kentucky does manage to take out one of their supports. Kazuki is the next to fall. Kentucky looking good to take this flash point back. Andy with a two-piece spear spin, putting two players in the blender, picks up Max really thereafter, and Claire, with the help of their Orisa, does manage to also pick up another. I, Kentucky, you don't have to do it, but I really, really want to just see the combo. Make the combo happen. Pull them into the terror surge, drop the cap to sun, and blow them up. Please. It makes my monkey brain happy. But they have the captain sun, the captive sun to use this turn as well. But Despacito, as long as he can just get picks like that, he got one of their supports to keep him at bay, find more time for his team. And Ashlyn has chosen to go over the JQ. Tired of the whole battle tower matchup. I get it, but. The scary thing is that Andy has Spear. JQ tries to use Rampage, you get Spear. Here comes the Captive Sun. This one is going to hit. Ooh. And that immortality Ooh. field that Kentucky threw down wasn't enough by a long shot. Uh, uh, M. Ashland threw down wasn't enough by a long shot. Kentucky just tore Ooh. through it. That's three gone. 97%. No way anyone's going to touch. Amplification major for good measure, and that is Kentucky walking away with the map to victory on Cervasa. But Kentucky obviously showing that they're the team that's a very comfortable. Hey, that's a nice comeback as well. For missing the first capture, <laughs> getting the getting one that hits and then getting play of the game from it. That's that's a that's redemption right there. Well, one thing also is you know Kentucky was very successful. And then we move to Flashpoint, and they are very successful there as well, demonstrating that yep. you know their comfort is control points. But now we're we're back to escort and push for the last two modes, and so the thing is, Kentucky is going to have to move out of their comfort zone if they want to get the W. Push doesn't exist. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> okay, they have escort. They have escort left. Well, of course. Double yeah. Dorado, just back to back. Yeah, yeah. Let's go Dorado and Rialto. Push, mm, mm, no. The worst part is when you got the team that, and I'm not saying this was really bad because this is typically how things go. Everyone hates two of the three types of push maps. So there's only one map that you practice and you've got to pray that the other team does not therefore ban it. Thankfully, Nace doesn't use a ban system just yet. And if you lose and you have to go on a push, you get to pick the one map that you enjoy. You just got to pray that the other team is picking the map you also like if you're not the one picking. We, we kind of always route, it's kind of the opposite of Escort. On Escort, we root for the outside choice to be picked. On Push, we're like, just please choose the one that It is wants. so long. It is eight, like if you choose Coliseo, we're spending five minutes looking at a corridor. And if there's Widowmakers, then everyone's just staring at the corridor. Like, I'm not peeking, you peek. And it, it gets painful. It's much less fun than uh, watching the Backroom series. It's a corridor series that just isn't isn't as fun to watch. I know some teams that are like, 
the only push mouth I practice is Esperanza, which I completely understand. That's valid. Some only do New Queen Street, and some you know that they're crazy because they only do Coliseo. <laughs> That's all I got to say. I, I respect it, but do I think you're a little crazy? Yes. I just think they're crazy because it's the only stage that's chosen that doesn't have a trolley on it. And it's just a train nerd myself. Coliseo, you're not choosing the one that, at least aesthetically for me, I can stand Toronto or Esperanza, but Coliseo on a pure superficial, very surface, no strategy yes! involved whatsoever, yes! doesn't do anything for me. It is going to be Esperanza. Esperanza! I'm fine with this. This is acceptable. Not saying I get any say in it, but this one's much more exciting to look at, at least. Also, can we talk about the fact that we introduced Push, and then Blizzard was like, here's three maps. We're going to make a new map type. Can you give us some more flavors? I'm, I'm tired of the Neapolitan variety of ice cream I'm getting with the Push maps here, Blizzard. That's a good point. At least we can make it a 50-50 shot of a decent stage for the all by itself. That's true. Yay, there's a drawing. I'm happy now. Five. See, that, that, you were talking three, a little bit earlier, the Alori combo makes your one. monkey brain happy. This is my monkey brain. I completely understand. All right, so we don't know which team is which, but of course, if you remember the names, you'll be able to identify them. We've got both teams running out on the day two competition. The one variant, Despacito, pulling out the four Bjorn, whereas we have Max up pulling out the Sojourn. Both, both can be very, very powerful compositions, but it all depends on playing to your strengths and baiting the enemy into those areas where you will be able to succeed the most. Forcing out Sojourn slide very early, Clario on that Genji. Well, it wasn't fast enough. Sojourn goes unpunished. Ducky swinging around the other way, so does Ashlyn. Genji moving in. It's a good chunk of damage but isn't able to land the pick. He gets taken out by Max Dutton. Uh, Turret has also gone for that Torb, and the Torb oh, follows shortly so afterwards. Butters also bites the dust. And then Junker Queen, they all collapse around her. Ashen University gets the first push. When you play a character like Corbjorn, I feel like if you don't get those picks or get the kill immediately, when someone starts coming after you, you have two options. And the one is land your shots. And if you don't land those shots, they're really the only, you have to go play at B, which is your option and that is for you run. And you're not the fastest once you're over, but when your um, overdrive goes off as far So, it's a little rough. Two ultimates come online for Ashland. They're gonna use both of them back to back, the beat and the rampage, and everyone from Kentucky. Oh. Now, the situation goes from bad to worse for Kentucky as the forward spawns are gotten for Ashlyn. Ashlyn wanted to secure this forward spawn position with the bot. We are now in transition phase. There's another term that's sometimes used for that I can't say on broadcast, but if you're aware of it, just look at the bot's animation during this whole sequence and you'll probably figure it out. Now we've got Mad, Do Mad Dog again, sorry, Mad Jack again with his team. He also doesn't have to worry about JQ ult, so theoretically, sees one that's a little deadly, can choose to use it. Revalia goes down, Butters responds to using his Zune Rush to make sure that Ashley University has the advantage, but Suzuki and Revalia both go down, as does JQ, as does Meme. Now Kentucky is in control. Probably have to survive for one more team fight to make sure that they can get that forward spawn off the table for Ashland. So the watch their flanks. That Tracer now has a pulse bomb. That Lucio isn't paying attention. We're gonna stir the pot a little bit here. Just as a reminder, yes, the scores above the team, well, next to the team name, those are the series scores. So Kentucky at series point. They want to win this and walk away. They want to go get their homework done. Ashland University <laughs> looking for this map win to send us to a map five because they want us to go to escort. They already got their homework. Yeah, they're, they're good. They're ready for the full five game series. And they're like, escorts are jam. It pushes a little bit. Oh, but this we can is get huge. Because we have Clario and Andy from Kentucky getting a two piece. There's a three piece Clario. Now was, that was a lot of Genji and not even how to use Blade. Those ghost dashes coming in strong. <laughs> All they had to do was spend the beat molt before and it worked out for them. Kentucky still has two ultimates left to use. Dragon Blade and the Terra Surge. 
You can just see Clario. He's already hiding up in these windows, just waiting for the opportunity to use the blade. He's gonna charge out though. He's so Yikes. low on health. Terra Surge is gonna be used by Andy. Trying to help bail that Genji out. Max is eliminated by Despacito. He's traded back with a punch to the Genji as he used Yikes. the Dragon Blade as well. That is tragic. Andy is running away. Has Despacito still alive? Butters was alive while I was talking, but both well, Butters and Despacito are now gone. Of course, says, okay, it's time for me to go to pasture and walk towards the bot to get eliminated. Game's very low on health, however. Just gonna barely survive that. Was taking a good bit of damage from the Torp turret, so. And that's the only thing on your team that gets the eliminated. Oh, it's gone. It comes in clutch sometimes, especially yeah, when you like. It's there for a reason. It's a part of his kit. Just does not have multi core. We have Kitsune Rush online for Kentucky. If you round up enough. I'm not a mass major. I'm allowed to round thing. Revalia does have Kitsune Rush as well. We have Mad Dub popping the overclock with the Kitsune Rush coming out from their side as well. A little strange to combo those, but to each their own. Let's hope that spending two is worth the payback they'll receive. Kentucky also brings the Molten Four to the party. Kitsune Rushes wear oh! off that Junker Queen, taking a lot of damage, and she is going to fall. Terra Surge also secure the fight. Kentucky wins it, but they have to spend everything. I mean, they, uh, Mad Jack almost has heat. That is true. If you're really rounding up, Mad Jack has heat. So does Memes as well. But the one who's closest is Masuki, who almost has their own Molten Core. Not so fast. One key pick on Masuki, or maybe Memes, and I think Kentucky has a chance. Way to work, finding what angle they want to push here. Molten Core now online for Vasuki, taking a whole bunch of damage. Almost was taken out by that Sojourn. However, survives, and the Molten Core now very much a factor as well as both Heat. Molten Core is going to be expended. Kentucky uses the beat in response. Now Ashen spends their beat. Andy gets a pick onto Vasuki, however, Kentucky is toughing it out. It was two ultimates against one, and Kentucky is looking like the winning team. Clario gets the pick on toward Max. Rampage now used by Ashland, trying to turn things around. Is able to take out Mad Jack. Andy, almost an elimination. just managed to escape. Butters inside of Kentucky also get used behind cleanup despite the lasting for a little bit too long. Did they need Kitsune for three people? And how long these two are dancing around? Yes, they robot. did. Vasuki picks up Despacito for Kentucky. This is one of the most drawn out fights I've seen. Now we see an overclock for Kentucky, a Kitsune rush for Ashland. The overclock comes in clutch as it eliminates Meeps and a terror surge as well for Kentucky. You know that this fight has gone on so long, they've used an ultimate, kept fighting, and then used the next ultimate that's been charged up. That they managed to charge over the course of this really long fight. Ashland's core of Kiriko, Lucio, and, oh, and JQ should not have lived. That Kitsune Rush should have secured the fight for Kentucky, because Ashland University uses, they're, they're an explosive composition. They need to, you know, use their cooldowns in conjunction, get the eliminations, and then, you know, get the cooldowns back. You run out of gas very quickly, whereas Kentucky can play the longer fight. But Ashland's adapting on the fly and is making these fights go extremely long. We have been chilling out around center point now for about three minutes. Despacito's gonna finally go down to max dubstep. And now it's time to start hitting that gas pedal if you're Ashland University. Moving back towards the challenge. Kentucky, but now we're back where we started. Which this is what World War One is. A lot of fighting and not much progress in any direction. Oh boy. All right, JQ. Show, show me what you can do. Andy has a spear. That's really the thing you gotta look out for. Spear, Suzu. Are we gonna get a well executed rampage or are we going to get spear? We are down to the last 90 seconds. 
Ashton University is leading as far as bot percentage goes. Suzu is using in response to the to cut short. B is used. B1 can, if theoretically can live, wait this out. Unfortunately, does pass away. Moncor used in response to losing the tank. Gonna give some extra forward space. Suzuki is also going to pass away. This is just... Yeah, yeah. You want to know what the punches look like. Yeah, yeah. Especially since the Molten Four was used, it was literally there. Kentucky managed to pick up a double, however, takes out that Lucio, and the fight finally comes to a close. Kentucky has a chance to just get past where Ashland was. They are going to get the forward spawn, which is very crucial. Ashland does have a rampage, however. Kentucky is going to be able to answer that with a Molten Four and the Kitsune Rush on the online today. Caveat of getting to that checkpoint with so little time on the clock is that stalled. The bot forces everybody through the transition phase, getting the checkpoint and moving forward again. It allowed Ashton to claim the space back. We have the we have Rampage online again. We got beat. The question is, are is this is Ashley going to play patiently enough, force the cooldown to be handy and butters to allow this Kitsune Rush to be well, allow this Rampage to be successful. Kitsune Rush is burned first. There's Spearson. There is Spear. B1 needs to be looking for his ultimate. There is that Rampage. Picks up one, almost gets the Kitiko, but if Kitiko uses switch steps, she is in hot water. B1H eliminates Mad Jack. Despacito trades it back by eliminating Max. Lucio's trying to survive. Terror Surge brought out by Kentucky. Doesn't get anyone, but does a lot of damage. Memes fall. The robot is pushing forward ever so slightly. They just need four meters, and it's overtime. Butters and Clario also get an elimination. The turret oh. is taken down. The torp goes down. There's just the Junker Queen left. And Kentucky, have they won it in overtime? They most almost did yep, it yep, stole down yep, for a little go, and they go. do oh my goodness what an ending they needed to come through they were a control focused team but they win in push also being you for getting all the way through the mischief mischief and magic battle pass that arc mage title means they hit every prestige and got all the way to the very end of the prestige option that's a lot of dedication playing Overwatch. Well, what a great game. But before we get to the next game, we also want to give a shout out to our various sponsors that support Nay Star League and make these broadcasts possible. And our sponsors are Truth and while we're at it, we also want to mention one of NASA's newest supporters, Odyssey Elixir. But first, let's talk about Truth a little bit. Truth is one of the nation's largest nonprofit health organization, helping to make tobacco and nicotine addiction a thing of the past. If you want to find out more about the effects of vaping on mental health, go to breathofstressair.com. And I mentioned Mushroom Elixir is one of NACE Star League's newest supporters. So go and boost your game with Odyssey Mushroom Elixir. It's the journey. It was quite a journey that last game. That was a very fun match to watch. Congratulations to Kentucky for picking up the win. Do you have any final thoughts on that match to close it out? Mm, I mean, I feel like a broken record when you ask me this question, but you know, he who ults first mm. wins the fight. And that Kitiko was very, um, very trigger happy with that Q button. That's all I gotta say. <laughs> And I'll leave it just at that. That is our first match in the books. We'll take a break and then be back with the next Overwatch match of the night. St. Clair is waiting in the wings to make a show of force. We'll see if they can do it after this break.
in the middle of our break between our first and second Overwatch matches of the night. But right now, we actually want to take a short time to interview Clario, one of the DPS players from Kentucky, just won their match in spectacular one fashion. So we're going to have that interview being to us live here in the arena. So once again, I'm Jim. We got Nerdy right here, and hopefully, we've also got Clario joining us from University of Kentucky. He will appear on the monitor once we get all that sorted out. Hey, there he is. Hello there. Hello. How are you doing? Congrats on your win. Thank you. Well, we wanted to ask a few questions uh, about the match that just transpired. We, we kind of saw a pattern where Kentucky really kind of, it really seemed you guys favored the control stages. I mean, you did a great job in the opening match and then on Flashpoint, which is essentially Control Plus, you did a very good job. So what kind of is it about control that kind of makes you uh, more uh, skilled at it? To be honest, I think on King's Row, we just kind of dropped our spaghetti a little bit. Like we were just kind of like, we got like discombobulated, started trolling, um, you know. Uh, I I don't think it's necessarily something about the control maps. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I mean, on the control points, we do like to run the uh, like uh, Bapillari stuff. So um I think like those maps kind of like uh, adhere more to our uh, strengths a little bit. Okay, and so my second question is, you kind of touched on it. With King's Row, it seems to be the map that, you know, everybody chooses for Escort. Were you guys anticipating having to go King's Row for the Escort map? And, you know, you struggled a little bit. What was the kind of mentality shift that you had going from the struggle that occurred on King's Row going into Flashpoint? Was there anything that was said, or was it just kind of like concurrently everyone was like, okay, hey, let's get our act together. We need to figure this out. We're not losing on Flashpoint. No, I mean, like, as soon as the map's over, it's just it's just go next. Like, we're just locked in. I mean, you can't – you got to be locked in. Like, like we, we got to be locked in at every stage of the game. And if we were, like, thinking about – uh but we uh, were, did wrong the last map or like spending too much time thinking about it, then uh, we're just gonna like be a waste of time. All right, well, we're sure you have a lot to get to. So we'll actually get you out on this last question. Will you consider coming back for like a special Star Wars themed match? Because I just have to point out how insane the Zarya fight was on King's Row at both of them at 100. I mean, did you take a second in your mind? I know you're focused on the game, but were you just looking at that going, wow, there's, this is the biggest beam fight I've ever seen? I mean, I've played so much Overwatch at this point. I'm used to the like just light shows that go on in the game. I mean, it's just like <laughs> there's 10 million abilities going on at any time. It's just like you, you can never tell what's happening. You just gotta like, like, like if you like try to like think about it, it's just over. All right. Well, thank you for joining us so much. Congrats on your win. Very entertaining to watch. Well, we're going to be getting on to the second match shortly. Let's actually take a look at what we have coming up for NACE Star League. We just finished our first match where Kentucky was able to beat out Ashland. And then we'll have our second of the night. It's going to be St. Clair versus Ferris State coming up very soon. So we're just going to do a quick swap out of casters, and then we will be back with the second game. This is NACE Star League Week 3. Don't go away. St. Clair, the Saints versus the... St. Clair, Saints versus Ferris State, right after this.
The day of Overwatch continues rolling on as we're ready to load up our second match of the night. It's going to be St. Clair versus Ferris State. Should be a very fun match. St. Clair is a well-established game in the esports game from Ontario, Canada. I'm still your host, Jacob Palmer. We've got a swap in for one of our casters. We've got Matt Murph joining us, of course, the Colombian player. And I understand you've played St. Clair before. Tell us a little bit about your experiences with them. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're a real underdog college, you know. They, they've had those upsets. They do have the talented players. This year, I'd argue that they've gotten some, some upgrades and some roles. You know, we do see Noxious coming in. He was on Hue. He's a really good hit scan player. And I, I, I think Saints, or St. Clair this year, is a bit more of a college to be feared compared to last year. But that's not to say they were bad last year either. Let's take a look at what led us up to this point of this match, St. Clair versus Ferris State. As I said, we started out with a very exciting game of Kentucky versus Ashland University. Came down to overtime on push, and Kentucky was able to win it. Now we move on to St. Clair versus Ferris State. The Saints versus the Bulldogs. And let's take a look at the roster that we have coming up here. Matt, if you're more familiar with St. Clair, why don't you read off their roster? So St. Clair, they have Squeak, Emerin, Noxious, Razor, and Soaks. Uh, Razor, an original Contenders player, he's been in the game since like 2019, I believe. And then you have Noxious coming over from Harrisburg. Just very talented players on the St. Clair roster. And then for Ferris State, we've got Virgil, Axe, Chance, Kavushki, and Duali. I always like uh, player names that are pretty fun to say. So. Props to Ferris State for making my job just a little bit more entertaining. It's just little things in life. All right, we're ready to jump into this stage. You were here watching the last game. Was there anything before we start this game that really stood out to you about that last one of Kentucky uh, versus uh, Kentucky versus Ashland? You know, maybe some trends you saw, some strategies you like that you might want to see in the second game. Um, you know, I just saw, like you said on Kings Row, uh, that that Zarya duel. Um, Zarya is just super strong right now. They, they did buff her allied bubble, the 45 charge potential if they break that bubble, as well as it lasting a little bit longer, being a little bit bigger. It enables characters like Genji. That's what I really want to see. We're just kind of getting an overview of everything that could be available to us. We're seeing stages from, uh, we're, we are seeing Lijon Tower, which we started out last time. Right now they're showing us uh, Circuit Royale. Should it go all the way to Escort? It would have to go all five games for that to start. But we are getting the confirmation we are starting out on Ilios for our first stage. And what of the three would you like to see most for Ilios to start out with? Um, I like well. Like okay, the, yep, we're on the same page. <laughs> the, the, the boops from the Lucio. Red X is a really good Lucio player. I'd, I'd like to see well. Well, and then I, I'm thinking uh, whether it's a Lighthouse or Ruins that I'd like to see more. Mm. Uh, you know, they're kind of mid for me, I suppose. Uh, maybe Lighthouse, maybe just that, just a little bit more. Of those two, I want to see Ruins, because I, like I said, I do know some of the players on St. Clair, and I think not just one of them could be quite the threat. But we are going to get our wish as we are starting out on well. So we're just going to not waste any time, cut right to the caster favorite for the first stage. We were talking about Zarya, but what else really pops out to you about what you want to see on well? Mm. On well, I could see potential for Junker Queen and Orisa. you know, those more rush brawl characters they Five, could be four, a little three, bit better here two, one. Round one. 
capture the objective. And we are off. It looks like this next teleport is going to be used by St. Clair to get to that point extra fast. It is wide open for them. They're rushing onward. Seems like we have two monkeys that are going to be battling out against each other. I feel great. Toward the point, the Reaper is going to try to get up on the high ground to contest it. Nothing's really fallen from either team quite yet. And Monkey on the side of Fair State falling real low. Wall Anti is able to survive at 1 HP. Anti does go down for the Monkey on St. Clair. Fair State, all they got was that Reaper left. The Lucio's going to have to run away. Oh, that Echo is just caught. Out. And St. Clair is just gonna, you know, sometimes it's feast or famine, but they are just going all feast right now as they're picking up staggers on top of their very well earned team wipe. And the Zacco is gonna get hacked right out of the air! Like a falling star, back to the ground you go. St. Clair almost building that rally and Pulse Bomb within the first fight, but they already won it. They got two picks. The Echo's not even back. We also got this Sombra who is just doing so much damage in the back line of Ferris State. None of them even looked back, so this Sombra could have a very great day today in terms of how much their how good their KDA is gonna be looking. And it looks like they are trying to take a fast fight in their spawn with Rally. Rally is expended as Ferris, Ferris State is just getting pushed all the way back toward their spawn. Rezzer also takes out Chance. Now Ferris State is now left in their spawn wondering how are they going to move forward from here. The Reaper's going to teleport off to the side. And the Sombra, they just walk right past each other. So now here comes the Sombra into the back line. It's going to give the call out towards St. Clair. A dive in by the Winston and Chance falls almost immediately. Moving in with the Primal Rage ready to use should be needed. Something tells me that St. Clair is just going to clear this out without the need for any ultimates. Yeah, St. Clair playing their comp super well with the ultimates. Pushing their their advantage, you know, they build the ults first, they use them early, not even letting Ferris State really prepare for them. Ferris State doesn't even look like they're going to be able to touch the points. St. Clair finds a sweep in their opening volley. Here we can see a replay of just how insane Sweet is on their tank. Ready. Talking about how you played a. Matt, you were talking about how you played against St. Clair multiple times. I understand you're on pretty friendly terms with them. Uh, yeah, there's some, some good friends on the team. I am friends with some of them. Uh, it's really interesting seeing how they've improved. I think some of them even made it into contenders for the first time this last summer. Very talented. One. Definitely showing that. Bulldog's going to try to turn things around though on Lighthouse. They're using Lucio's speed boost to waste no time getting toward the point. And Claire is deciding to take the high ground route instead. Up Ferris State goes. The Genji climbs up. They're trying to focus down one of the support. And Claire is trying to take it out. Soaps is taking a bit of damage through their armor, but. St. Clair manages to survive through Ferris State's initial volley. Wally got hit with the anti nade and just short on time from there on out. St. Clair wins the fight, moves on to the point. It's going to continue moving where they left off. Yeah, St. Clair, as long as they can survive that engage from Ferris State, that's really all Ferris State's comp can do is just push forward. So as long as St. Clair with that on a brig are able to sustain each other, they should be able to just win the neutral. Oh no, the Kiriko almost got hacked. A trade back and forth in terms of the elimination. Soaks is the first St. Clair Saint to fall. Oh my goodness, Wally just went right in to that, uh, right into Razor. 
Fair Estate picking up some good eliminations here and there. Picked one up onto Noxious. Emmerin's the next to fall. Now they just have to deal with this Winston. All Primal Rage up. A rally coming back in for the recontest from St. Clair. There's also a Death Blossom available, but there are a lot of shields on the point. Death Blossom is used. It does pick up Soaps. Fair Estate has given it their all to try to take back this point. They're going to force the Winston to jump away, and that's enough for Saint, uh, for Fair Estate to claim the point for themselves. The only question is, is Kavushki, as he moved far in too far, he is able to take out Emerin, rates away to get back with his team. Yeah, Saint Clair, they used four ults trying to recover from that fight, trying to turn it around, and they weren't able to. So now they only have EMP remaining. Just how much that EMP can do, but chances already eliminated for Ferris State. The EMP lands onto three. Kitsune Rush was used by Axe, but now not too many teammates left to take advantage of the boosts that gives. Ferris State falls, and St. Clair gets the point back. On the side of St. Clair, they are now they're building up those ults they use, trying to clutch up that fight. And so now it's going to be really hard for Fair State with almost no ults to try and press through this defense. As they can just cycle the ults on the side of St. Clair. Oh, the Reaper's following the monkey after that dive in. Sweep is turning around, trying to find some way to take out St. Clair before they do too much damage. But the Pulse Bomb is thrown out. There's some chance. Both supports down for Ferris State. Now both DPSs and add a tank to that as well. St. Clair gets another team wipe. And it's probably just going to coast right on into finish. Yeah, we see St. Clair playing that like more defensive style that fight. Knowing that all Ferris State comps are going to try to do is run over the supports of St. Clair. So you saw Sweet leap backwards actually trying to protect his supports and it worked out real well for him. St. Clair is going to take the first stage control with Ferris State. Did a good job in being able to take the point back from St. Clair. I mean, St. Clair used four ultimates to try to take out the point and, and uh, Ferris State still managed to get through all of them. So something to say about how that said about how that fight turned out. Soaks is actually going to be the one to support the Brig picking it up. Of course, getting environmental on Ilios. I greatly, greatly approve. All right, so that's the first st match gotten pretty quickly. And what do you say if, if you're Ferris State, you're the Bulldogs, and you're looking to pull something out of St. Clair? I, I don't think the, the choice is to go, to go on King's Row. You're talking about how there's contenders players in this team. Yeah. If there's anyone that's going to know everything about King's Row, it's going to be them. Yeah, that is a map a lot of people second map in the scrim you load in you're gonna get king's row most people are super practiced on that map especially if they're in contenders so seeing that variety of maps trying to pull a, a, a surprise map out might be the bulldogs best chance here of course any any justification whatsoever for seeing blizzard world i will fully fully go through because it is an out there choice but you're going to have to switch up something with St. Clair because it seems like they've, they've gotten their strategy so refined down that you, you just want to try to find anything to really upset the state of play that we are in here. We are getting the confirmation that it's James Rogan. Yeah. Not too surprising there, to say nope, the least. Nope, nope, not, <laughs> not too surprising there. Okay. Let's all get to King's Row then, as I said in the first stage, with a smile on my face and the bitterness in my heart. But here we go. We will move on to the next stage. And just kidding, of course. I have seen a lot of exciting matches on King's Row. It's just always fun comedically to have that one punching bag <laughs> that you can always go back to. But it's popular for a reason. And... Uh, as Nerdy said in the first match, it's really an all-or-nothing stage. And St. Clair, I, I am almost thinking that it's just going to be all for them. So you're really thinking a thing of Ferris State is being forced in a position where they're going to have to at least force this to overtime. Yeah, I would expect some different compositions, especially from St. Clair. You don't see the monkey picked too often on King's Row. 
But at the same time, you saw they looked very strong on that monkey comp. Their back line was able to survive the hard engage of the Bulldogs. But it looks like at least one team is going to be on Reinhardt here. The Kings Road Classic. We haven't actually seen too much Ryan in the past few weeks, so it's nice to see him be brought back. Nice throwback to Overwatch 1, Kings Row. Yep. That's the classic, you know, you get the Ryan and May, Wall and Maul. Yep. So some classics Five, just never die. Four, They're classics for three, Seems two, like a bit of a spawn one. hold going on Second here with the positioning. And St. Clair, with how much they push Ferris State back to their own spawn, I'm really not surprised that they're taking this route to start off game two. This is, man, this is something that's really kind of amplifying the all or nothing state of King's Road. They're pushed so far forward that, I mean, they can, they can burn a lot of time off Ferris State. But at the same time, if Ferris State just manages to explode and be able to take out St. Clair, and they're pushed past the choke point. There's no one really holding that far back for St. Clair. So the point is pretty much completely open to them if they're quick and can make it around. But they're caught in the alleyway as well as damage is just pummeled right onto them. And that is another team wipe. St. Clair takes it again. And the Junkrat spamming those choke points in the spawn has already built his ult, which I think might catch the Bulldogs off guard you really don't expect an ult to be built that quickly. And he brings out, oh my goodness, you don't do. <sighs> okay, St. Clair, I mean, it's showing, you're just gonna rip tire right into the spawn. Okay, I see how it is. All right, the Rhine heads out. They're going to use the wall to try to split up St. Clair. In they go. But St. Clair, once again, a mine from the Junkrat gets a double. Ferris State once again left searching. Looks like the Reinhardt's going for a sneaky shatter here on the side of St. Clair. But with the Sim TP on the side of Ferris State, they might unknowingly teleport right past them. I don't even oh. see. I don't even see the shatter, but I'll take the elimination fee. I'll, I'll take their word there. for it that it was a good shatter. Yeah. Hello. There's only Kavushki left. And if there's anyone I would want left, it's Kavushki. Overclock now online for St. Clair as well as the amplification matrix because that's the one thing St. Clair wasn't lacking at. You know, let's let's put even more damage. Ooh, I like this play from the Rhino. They're rotating off into the theater, giving themselves a bit of cover. They're gonna go around the Rosie, but their team is kind of awkwardly split up. Emerin is taken, out, takes out Virgil, gets a double axe, is able to get rid of their Lucio, but now this Riptire is charged up yet again. For the love of all things decent in the universe, do not just put it into the spawn again. I wanna see creativity. It looks Emerin, like, okay, I, I see he what he's going for. I see what he's going for. <laughs> Will the Bulldogs spot Emerin above with Riptire? I don't think they're gonna. They're all grouped. They try and get right past the oh. stick player, but they are not able to make it. Oh, we have a Ryan battle right on point, but the rest of the DPS is from St. Clair. Turn around. And that is another team wipe. Ferris State, if there's one chance they have, it's going to be all the ultimates that they have for this push. Yeah, they do have both support ults and an Earth Shatter. St. Clair only having that Lucio beat, maybe building Earth Shatter mid fight. But everything is being used, everyone's pushing Q. Kavushki manages to get a pick onto Emerin, but the elimination feed has shown a whole lot of blue. St. Clair. Holds Ferris State to not even one tick on the stage. St. Clair up until this point was undefeated in their season and we can see why. Every time I'm, I'm so shocked as I'm trying to talk about the ults, they use them so early I don't even have a chance. Just constantly pushing that aggressive play style against Ferris State. Initiating. 
I'm going to take a look here at, they tried to use the sim teleport, so this Junkrat tire actually had a ways to go before it made it toward the team. I mean, I liked Ferris State's thinking. I mean, they were changing it up. I mean, so many times, you know, as Nerdy was talking at the beginning of this broadcast, it was mainly about hero swaps, but it's also root swaps as well. You gotta sometimes change things up, and they were trying rotating through theater, they were trying using the sim teleport. I mean, Great. Ferris State threw everything they could at it, and I have to commend them for that. Unfortunately, St. Quid did get a full hold against them. So now, the fire's burning underneath them. They have to play this defense so well if they want to draw than that because they didn't even get a tick well time's ticking down the bulldogs better get to the point they're only now leaving the station yes the train was late as always but now we are here ready to fight st Clair, looking like they're not going to stop their high speed frenzy you were saying you know you don't often see winston on king's row but i think st Clair is going to try to find a way to make it work Three, two, oh no oh, nope, they swapped their okay. they were just baiting us the run land a pin? Did I see that correctly? That was a great hack. He was about to charge and one thing is St. Clair is their their Sombra has just been on point wrecking so much havoc with Ferris State's abilities. Anti-nade thrown onto Chance. He's backing up further on toward the point. Sombra's gonna hack one of the health packs and then get ready to do even more havoc in the back line. But sweet falls from Chance. A great flame strike to take out St. Clair's tank. Razor's the next to fall. Virgil is eliminated by Emerin, but now they know about the Sombra's plans. Razor's gonna rape away. It is a hold for now by the Bulldogs. Ferris State is happy to win a couple of fights here. They're building their ult slightly faster than St. Clair, but we do small no. to fall. This is yeah, this is your specialty map. <laughs> the wrecking ball. Yes, and you see the junk getting a little silly with the angles. It's only this Reaper that can try to stall it out with the Wraith on point. But that's not enough. St. Clair takes the second round. Only so much Paris State can do when they're able to get surrounded like that. We have the junk top left, the Sombra taking an angle, and the ball slamming on the engage. Noxious is going to be picking up the play of the game on Soldier. Two down. I, mean, I would have given that to the junk rat on the rip tire, but I, I think he lost all his karma in the first, you know. Again, rip tiring just right into the spawn with no regard to whether they're pushed past the, health, the healing wall or not. I'm going to have to take a few points off for that in terms of just style. Yeah, rip tire a little bit early there. Okay, so we're going into what could be the final stage. St. Clair looks like they are just barreling right towards a 3-0 sweep. But we still have Flashpoint to do and two choices on Flashpoint. So you got a 50-50 chance, Matt. What are you choosing? New Junk City. Every time we've said New Junk City and every time so far on Nace Star League, we have seen a diff the different choice on Flashpoint. Nerdy, who's just off camera, is turning and giving quite a look to us, so I'm wondering if we're just going to see for the third time in a row another same stage <laughs> and just whether this whole New Junk City thing even exists or if it's just a figment of my imagination at this point. You have to win at some point if you keep betting on red. <laughs> you have to win at some point. That's a good, that's a good philosophy to follow. Well, I guess not good. There's a um, reason why the casinos are so tall at Vegas. It's for people <laughs> following that. that and, okay, getting back to the point, though, what are you seeing from St. Clair that you think is making them so strong in the way that they attack? Just like I've said, that, that aggression from them. They, uh, they barely even give the, the enemy a chance to think, let alone me, as I'm watching. <laughs> it looks like it's Servasa. It's not New Junk City. We're not going to see that stage ever, no matter how many times our casters say that it's the preferred stage. Nope, let's go to Servasa. Hey, I don't mind it at all. I, we've seen a lot of exciting stuff on Servasa. Very interesting map, a lot of angles, a lot of high grounds, a lot of potential for some uh, silliness, to say the least. So, St. Clair, 
just one victory away from claiming this, sweeping it, and moving on undefeated in their Nace Star League season. They're off in a sight in Nace Star League postseason events. One. We consider it a top competitive team. Initial flashpoint. Market. Flashpoint is going to start out on market like it always does. We're going to see both teams now book it as fast as they can to get toward the flash point. Ferris State is first. Really like St. Clair, ooh. This is the first time we're seeing a Zen be brought out. I, I'm scared of Ray's ability if he's, he's confident enough to bring out a Zen. Yeah, it's going to be a lot harder for Chance on Junker Queen to survive against the Bastion, Zarya, and the Zen. There's so much damage potential. Soldiers trying to get away is not going to be able to. The rest of Ferris State are falling. It's just a stall out at this point with the Wraith for Ferris State. They move on to the flashpoint, capture it. Now the squirrels start moving up. You see, Tom will remain the same. Ferris State probably need to try and find their way onto the Zen in order to win this one. Prevent that Discord from being kept throughout the fight. Savushki gets the pick onto Ray, my hero, the best gamer take of the match. And Chance also gets a pick onto Emerin. This is the chance for Ferris State to take it back. They're moving on to the point. Still three Saints to deal with, but the soldier makes his way onto the point. Starts the charge up. There's no one near for St. Clair. They're just going to reset at this point. Ferris State takes it back. But you know, like I said, they do need to get rid of that Discord. And that's exactly what Kabushki! he did. Kavushki again! The double! Ferris State and my hero! And he's got the Death Blossom ready to go. Okay, let's see it, Kavushki. Come on! Looks like they go early with the Kirill. They can even just get the Suzu out here. It'll allow the Reaper to get more value. Kavushki gets another one. He's waiting for the rest of the Saints. Moving in this side route now. He's going to have to time this right. That's both bubbles used by the Zarya. As long as they're making sure they're playing around those cooldowns, it is a green light for Kabushki to just do have it. He brings out the Death Blossom, picks up the Kuriko. Squeak also falls, and Ferris State is on their way to taking the first flash point. Yeah, with 90% on the clock, it's unlikely St. Clair even has a chance to touch here. Nice job by Ferris State. They pick up market. They're going into this fight with more ults than St. Clair. If they can get that Suzu out once again, it'll enable Chance with that Drunker Queen ult. Nothing to cleanse it. We're seeing a lot of swaps over by St. Clair as well. They've swapped off of that Zarya, moved on back to the Junker Queen. Noxious has gone over to the Hanzo. Ferris State has a rampage just about ready. Kitsune Rush is going to be expelled by Ray. The visor is going to be used in return as well as the rampage. Emerin's current gets taken out, and that Moira just pokes her head out, gets a visor right to the face. But St. Clair has picked up a double, so can Ferris State still defend this. They do manage to pick up the point, but the question is for how long as the respawn starts to come in? Emerin is able to eliminate Virgil. St. Clair takes the flashpoint back. Yeah, we saw Chance go in with that Junker Queen ult, but Razor was holding on to that cleanse, and as soon as he came in, he helped his team stay up through it, just automatically countering that ult. St. Clair also has a good response to the one ult of Fair State. Oh! Wow. Oh. Or they just land a couple headshots. That works too. Might just be the scenario. Oh, off the edge, you go! Oh! St. Clair, you're better than that. Oh no. It's also amazing that the water just doesn't make any sort of splash whatsoever. But again, small indie company, you know, you can't count on water physics at this point. It's, uh, it's a different type of water. We're on to the next flashpoint. 
St. Clair has a whole bunch of ultimates. I think this Hanzo just might have been a competitor because he is just picking up everybody, throws out the dragons, but Kavutsky once again, the savior of Fair Estate. Virgil picks up Noxus, puts an end to his bow armed reign of terror, and Fair Estate is making their way back on toward this flashpoint. This Moria is surviving, but has to wraith has to move away. Fair Estate takes the flashpoint back for themselves. We saw Fair Estate's coordination there. They popped that Kiriko ult, and almost immediately Squeak went down on Junker Queen. Just the focus fire from Fair Estate was so good there. Squeak is deciding to go full flavor with the Wrecking Ball. The name fits the character. Moves in, slams down, actually doesn't slam down. Kavushki does have this rip, uh, this Death Blossom available. That's a lot of damage that the Wrecking Ball has taken. Squeak slams down, eliminated by Kavushki. Pickle Piglet also gets a pick onto Red X. They are both on fire and Ferris State on their way to taking the second flashpoint. Do not disrespect them, St. Clair. The Bulldogs are here to fight, and they are just one flashpoint away from claiming this entire stage. Yeah, I don't, I have to say, I'm not a fan of the, the ball pick in Ferris State's comp. There's so much to force them out, so much that can live through it. There's only so much that ball can do. And so we see Squeak swap onto Ryan. Kind of a Junker Queen counter pick in a way. Flashpoint unlocks in 10 seconds. Here they are. Get ready. We'll see St. Clair with control of the point to start, but Fair Estate with their ults just going to the high ground. St. Clair is going to be the first to take this third flash point. Kavushki just waiting with the Death Blossom. Moves in thanks to the Katsune Rush in. The May's going to hide for now. Oh, wow, Kabushki. the Death Blossom all around takes all of her teammates out of the picture. The Rhine is charging right to his death. Is going to end to make sure that there is no stagger being brought out onto St. Clair. But a victory is a victory for Ferris State. They've got the flashpoint back for themselves. And what could be the winning one for them? Yeah, the time ticks so quickly on this, using ults to win a fight like that, even if they use three, isn't bad. Basically guarantees only one fight to actually try and take the point. They pass St. Clair in their ultimate ult charge. St. Clair does not have an ultimate to engage on this point. Fair State does have this beat, but they need to tank through any sort of damage. First chance, Ooh. though! Talk about target focus. Everyone just focused onto him. He falls for Fair State. That beat comes through too late. Now St. Clair sitting on three ultimates, taking back the flashpoint. We'll see. The only ult on the side of Fair State is Visor, which into the Rhine Shield really doesn't get too much value. It's going to be hard. He has to set up an off angle, but this point's so close that it might be impossible. I just want to save it for the next checkpoint. This ends now. Window thrown down by St. Clair as well as the overclock. That corridor is a dangerous one to be in for Ferris State. They're going to move off out of the sidelines for St. Clair. Let those two ultimates burn themselves out. And they dealt with two, but they got three left. A huge shatter being brought out by St. Clair. Oh, but the wall goes up right into the own right who charges. Oh, no. You prevented your Ryan from doing even more havoc to the team. I mean, you won the fight, but again, there's just weird things that are happening with St. Clair's performance here. And even though Fair State did lose that fight, you got to give them some credit. They kited the first two ults used by St. Clair, the window and the Sojourn ult, so well. And they didn't use any ults of their own. They forced three on the side of St. Clair. Allowing them to just focus more on this point now that they uh, have can have an ult fight. We're on to the fourth flash point. Katsune Rush and Visor to open it up. It's answered back with the Blizzard and Beat. And that Blizzard and Beat keeping Ferris State at bay. And St. Clair is fighting back with force. They're moving in. The soldier is just gonna just gonna take himself out for the good of the team. Let St. Clair take the point. 
and allow Ferris State to fight back as a full team Hello. shortly. Some great ults from St. Clair there, splitting Ferris State when they had that ult advantage. Now they almost have the window sojourn ult combo back up again. Can Ferris State kite it as well the second time is the question. Let them up. Here goes the window, a whole bunch of damage onto Ferris State. Forcing them to just hang back for the moment. Good to see you. Ferris State doing so well at avoiding that window, just running, taking a different angle. And the reaper roll from Kabushki. Oh, Kabushki! Oh, my heart is broken. He was the one to turn it around so many times for Ferris State, and it's fizzling out. We're gonna be going on to the fifth and final flashpoint. Again, seems like another big ult fight will be coming up. Ferris State, you know, 50% to the supports in Visor, and they do have that Junker Penal, and there's no cleanse this time around on St. Clair's side. So if Ferris State can get a good engage, it's gonna be hard for St. Clair to survive. Gonna go all the way over to Ruins to decide the fate of this match. Will St. Clair sweep at 3 0? Or will Ferris State pick up a victory? They've got this rampage. The Junker Queen is moving in. She brings it out, moves, goes over the whole team. A huge anti nade also placed onto St. Clair. Immortality Field to bail them out, but one of them falls. It is Noctis. Meanwhile, the rest of the team traded two for one. Ooh. Kavushki comes through with the double, the, the triple. He quads, he's back in form. He is there to push Ferris State to the fifth last point. Say we will not be counted out. Kavushki knew the camera was on him for the last Reaper roll and he said, I need to redeem myself. And that he did. Production, I, I'm just asking you, if we do a top five of this, I just want all Kavushki plays, okay? Just make it the top five Kavushki plays, please. I'm begging you. Ooh, the wall from Emerin, Kavushki gets caught out. Noxious and Emerin pick up a double. There's just three left for Ferris State. Kavushki was one to fall. And now this Ryan is just gonna do what he does best, just Holy smaller heroes around. St. Clair picks up the point. More than halfway there for Ferris State. They've got to overcome possibly five ultimates. St. Clair is almost all charged up. Ferris State, though, they're also building up ults of their own. It's going to be a battle of who can use their ults better, and it looks like St. Clair is going to do their classic where they go early with them. Ooh, that's a scary window for St. Clair to set up. Chances split because of it, and St. Clair runs him over. The rest of Ferris State just getting out of that fight. Ferris State nearly four ultimates, nearly five. If they want, yeah, if they want to just do it in this team fight, they might just try to make sure that they're charged up. I mean, both of these teams are probably going to have at least four ultimates. Here we go. Blizzard versus the Kitsune Rush. The Blizzard worked out so well for St. Clair before. That Visor now brought out by Ferris State. As the, oh, the shadow, shadow goes out from St. Clair. And, and it gets everyone touch. from Ferris State. They flip with Kavushki. over, but Kavushki has a plan of his own. Him with Chance with the Rampage. Oh. Noxious oh. picks him up. One last valiant effort from Ferris State. But St. Clair is going to sweep this one, three and zero. But oh my goodness, that was such an exciting flashpoint round. That was the most excitement I've had in one round that basically saved the whole match for me in terms of entertainment value. Huge props to Ferris State for making it as competitive as it was in that flashpoint. The last fight just so incredibly close there. Kavushki almost clutched it back up as he has in the past. Oh, well, great job for St. Clair picking up the victory. That second match is going to end in pretty short fashion. So we will have the third match coming up for you after this break. But before we get to it, we're going to leave you with a video from our sponsors at Truth. And then also during the break, I don't know if production is going to 
fulfill my request for the Kavushki highlight, but, but we'll see. We'll, we'll see what they come up with. But I know for sure we will have the video from Truth, and then we'll take it forward to break. We'll have the third Overwatch match of the night get set up. We have an interview, I'm being told, with, uh, with Red X, however. So that will be another thing that we will get to before the next match starts. Vaping nicotine can actually increase feelings of stress. Yet some vape companies get rich telling you it's a stress reliever. So let's call it what it is. It's a breath of stress air.
to the Nay Star League studio. We just saw the second match of the day conclude as St. Clair pulled off a 3 0 sweep. And we have a player from the Victorious team that is going to, that is going to be joining us right in the middle of the Nay Star League arena. By Matt Merton. I think we're going to be joined by Fred X here from St. Clair. St. Clair Saints. Fred X is going to be beamed into us live to see. We're just going to ask him just about what oh. happened in that last match. Red X, excuse me, I'm sorry. Oh, hi. Oh, hi. What's hi. up, Nay Star League uh, Nation? Yeah, well, congrats on your 3 0 win. I, I just got to ask a, a few things uh, about your match because what I most want to know was what was going on during that flashpoint uh, stage because you were pretty smooth sailing until you reached there. You had to kind of pull off a mini reverse sweep in, the, in that one round. You know, I heard the Pyongyang Pelicans were calling, and our team wanted to put out a tribute to them because we're really big fans of them. And uh, we tr tried to pull out their comp and uh, didn't turn out, so we had to go back to our, our regular comp. All right, well, I got someone here that I'm sure you know, Matt, who wants to ask his own <laughs> questions. Matt, what do you got? Uh, yeah, we saw you play uh, the Moira on Servasa. I want to know, are you feeling more confident on that hero now that you've played with Nolan Corona V? What inspired yeah, that pick there? Yeah. Of course, yeah. yeah. I got Nolan in my heart. I just feel I got Moira coming through my veins. I got damage orbs. I got healing orbs. I'm just, I'm just a Moira queen. That's all I have to say about that. All right. Well, we know you're busy, so we'll get you out on this. But I am still blown away by your team's acrobatics. When one of your team members fell into the water, there was no splash, oh, yeah. no ripple. It was like just a smooth transition. I'm just wondering, how do you pull off such great water acrobatics? I don't know. Emran is a he's just absolutely a great swimmer. He had his head straight up like this. Perfect dive. 10 out of 10, zero splash. The judges on the side obviously have realized it was a 10 out of 10 dive. So that, that's great that you everyone, guys noticed that. Everyone except for the Russian judge, but it's always that one that gives a lower score. But that is all that we have for you tonight. Congrats on your 3-0 win. We'll get uh, to our next match as soon as we can. But thank you so much for joining us, Red X. Thank you very much. Have a great night. Thank you. We are definitely, and it's going to be an even greater night as we move on to our third game. You're not going to want to go away. We'll take a break and then be back with the third of four Overwatch games tonight on Nace Star League. crash and they're going to use both of them back to back the beat and the rampage and everyone from kentucky oh. and now kentucky also brings the molten four to the party the rushes wear oh. off that junker queen taking a lot of damage and she is gonna fall terror surge also to secure the fight Kentucky wins it, but they had to spend our lead studio. We're currently in the middle of our break between our first and second Overwatch matches of the night. But right now, we actually want to take a short time to interview Clario, one of the DPS players from Kentucky, who just won at their match in spectacular one fashion. So I don't think they're gonna. They're all grouped. They try and get right past. Oh. Players, but they are not able to make it. Oh, we have a Rhine battle right on point, but the rest of the DPSs from St. Clair turn around. Yeah, it's going to be a lot harder for Chance on Junker Queen to survive against the Bastion, Zarya, and the Zen. There's so much damage. 
potential. Soldiers trying to get away is not going to be able to. The rest of Pharaoh State are falling. It's just a stall out at this point with the rate. Saint Clair also has a good response to the one ult of Pharaoh State. Oh! Wow. Oh. Or they just land a couple headshots. That works too. Might just be the scenario. Oh, off the edge, you got. Oh. St. Clair, you. This is nerdy work already turning on their mic.
to deal with, but the soldier makes his way onto the point, starts the charge up, there's no one near for St. Clair, they're just gonna reset at this point, Fair State takes it back. Well, you know, like I said, they're sitting together in that discord, and that's exactly what- Kabushki! Kabushki again! The double! For the rest of the Saints, moving in the side route now, he's gonna have to time this right, that's both levels used by the Zarya. They're making sure they're playing around those cooldowns. It is a green light for Kabushi to just do have it. He brings out the Death Blossom, picks up the Kuriko. Squeezle Piglet also gets a pick on to Red X. They are both on fire and Ferris State on their way to taking the second flashpoint. Do not disrespect them, St. Clair. The Bulldogs are here to fight, and they are just one flash point away from claiming this entire stage. Huge Antinade also placed onto St. Clair. Immortality Field to bail them out, but one of them falls. It is Noxious. Meanwhile, the rest of the team traded two for one. Kavushki comes through with the double, the, the triple. He quads, he's back in form. He is there to push Ferris State to the fifth flash point. Here we go. Blizzard versus the Kitsune Rush. The Blizzard worked out so well for St. Clair before. That provisor now brought off by Ferris State. As the, oh, the shadow, shadow goes out from St. Clair. And, and it gets everyone from Ferris State. They flip with Kabushki. over, but Kabushki has a plan of his own. Him with
Overwatch series here for week three. I am your host now, Artie Dirty Bird Rain, joined by Matt, Matt Berg, Dante. How you doing, Matt? Good, how about you? I'm excited to go into these last couple of matches for the evening. I mean, this next one is going to be between Texas A&M Buffalo going up against the UT Comets. And of course, you know, you have a history with the Comets. Based off of what you know about them, how do you, what are your thoughts going into this first map? Um, so I'm actually pretty close friends with some of the players on their teams, and I've heard they're doing quite well in scrims recently, so I'm excited to see what they have to pull out. Obviously, they're not telling me all their secrets. That's fair. Well, we, what's definitely not a secret is how we ended up here tonight, so we can take a quick look at the entire schedule that we had leading up to this point. We are going to be starting our third series of the evening, but two have completed, and if you miss those, we can give you a quick recap of how those shook out real fast between our first match, and we can take a quick look now. First match was between Ashland University and Kentucky. Ended up being one to three, Kentucky winning that one out on the final map. Then St. Clair taking on Ferris University. St. Clair 3-0, winning it out on Servasa. And now we're going to go into West Texas A&M, taking on the UTD Dallas Comets, which of course still a best of five series. And then after that, we'll go into the University of San Francisco taking on UNLV in our open division for the NACE Star League. So. We got to start out on control, and we got some leaks. Yeah. Someone was very fast to let production know which map they'd like to start on, which we appreciate. Nepal, though, is what we'll be starting on. And for that starting map, we'll have these players for the side of West Texas A&M. It's going to be Icarus, Mommy, Karma Eternal, Juice Box, as well as Miss Olivia. UTD, Do Dewey, Mallard, Kashir, Phone, and Pugga. All right, so as we get ready to jump into Nepal, if theoretically we start out on Sanctum, what map, what uh, heroes do you think we'd be seeing from either of these teams, or what would you be anticipating we'll see? I'm going to say, at least from UTD, seeing that starting roster, you know, I would have expected Derpy, but now that he's not in, I'm going to expect a Junker Queen, maybe. One of the off tank heroes, at least from them. Okay, well, I mean, if Derpy was in, I'd expect Reinhardt. Yeah. I mean, Reinhardt all the way. That, that's his go-to pick. So with that in mind, yes, I do agree. Most likely going to see the JQ. JQ doesn't work out. Possibly swap over to Zarya. Not so much Battle Cattle. If we see the Orisa pull out, I will be a little bit intrigued. And so Nepal, we've mentioned it before. Jacob, who was on earlier, definitely you know, sang his swan song to that map. Enjoy seeing environmentals. I love seeing environmentals, but... You're not so much of the Lucio player, so is that kind of a bane when you are the tank, even though the passive that kicks in makes it a little bit harder to get booped off? In Overwatch 1, I'd say I wasn't the biggest fan of him, but now that that, that passive has come in, I, I can't complain about it. Okay, so if your teammates get booped off, it's like, that's your fault, not mine. Yeah. Simply put, that's totally fair and fine, but hopefully no tank makes, a stank, it makes the mistake and ends up going into the drink, as, so to speak, as we get ready to load into Nepal. we were about to see what the first map was. And we are going to get a quick viewpoint of every single map. The first one you saw with the square pit, that is Sanctum. Taking a quick look at Village, which is a love it or hate it out of the three sub maps for Nepal. And then finally, we will have the Sanctuary map. This one's my personal favorite. I like the opportunity to have it more open air. It allows for more compositions to come into play. Out of the three sub maps, though, which is your favorite? Um. Yeah, I don't know the name of it, but that one right there with the elephant. Okay, that's totally fine. Do, uh, do you, uh, worst one out of the three, though? I will say, I'll go with Village. Okay, uh, I all hate right. Brawl. I hate Village as well, so both of us are in agreement on which one sucks the most and which one's the best out of the three. We'll have to wait and see what the Overwatch gods decide is going to be our first map for this rotation. Honestly, if we start out on Village, I anticipate the JQ coming out from UTD. If in West Texas, most likely going to roll out on the horse in that instance. We'll have to wait and see. Of course, if you're on JQ, you really got to play carefully going up against that horse. Yeah, and on Village, um, there's just that potential to hide on the point. I'm not really a fan of that. <laughs> I want to see fights, not uh, 
cowardice. Yeah, press your advantage. Don't play the runaway game. As some might say, you need to go walk on them and T-pose. Definitely need to assert your dominance. Play cleanup quickly. And it does look like we are getting very close to loading in. Never mind. I am bad at telling time. <laughs> Still going to be taking a look at all three of these submaps. The worst of all, Village being showcased right now. You can see why Matt does not enjoy this map. You can just play and hide here on the point and run away over towards the coastline. Our favorite map now. The call out normally for everyone is to run to Elephant. You gotta lock that space down. A Little bit more difficult to get the environmentals on this map, which is also probably why I enjoy it. And then the final map, of course, in the, sub in the three map rotation is this Sanctum. Hopefully you don't have a Roadhog going up against you and hooking you off the map. You don't wanna get spear spin. Javelin booped by a Lucio or a Farah to fall off the map. Thankfully, Kitiko can't do that anymore because that was yeah. ridiculous when that was able to happen. Yeah, I think that, yeah, actually, now that I think about it, I think we might see, now that when, when Zarya was mentioned, I was like, that actually makes a lot of sense for UPD. I think we might see a Zarya Genji comp. Um, it's been rumored to be pretty good. Yeah, the uh, bubble to Genji upon Lucio to dash to kind of pierce through any sort of brawl composition and then follow up with your bash and swinging wide in turret form. It's be quite deadly, it's just a matter of identifying if the other team composition is actually breakable using that. Because if you do that instead, you burn three cooldowns and the other team, they just chose to hit the S key and are now running at you, you're in big trouble. And it is going to be starting out here on Village, which is Ah, a love it or hate it style map. Five, we'll have to wait and see four, how both teams decide three, to adapt in order two, to accommodate one, for the map style here. One, Doors have dropped and we can take a quick look at what both teams have decided to roll out on. Uh, you see the jungle scene on both sides actually. Bit of a easier comp from UPD with the Sim Bastion. Like the side of the is on. Yes, they are currently the ones in the blue. Bone has gone into the bastion form. Hugo picks up two. They claim the most space at the beginning, walked all the way to doorway, forced the mid rotation, and then with that Lucio, you're just able to walk onto them, catch them out in rotation. Going low ground really stinks if you have to do it. The Sim Bastion so good at taking different angles against that Junker Queen comp. You know, while West Texas, their comp kind of needs to just go through one angle with the mech. You can use the teleport gives them a lot of options. It does, and that May wall, which you want to use to wall someone off and delete, unfortunately gets deleted by a Bastion who has removed two players from the playing field, and Cashier will find one more, Doi will find one, and Bone finds the use box to close out that team fight with a team wipe for UTD. We'll see West Texas switching up their comp a little bit, going out to Bastion and Reaper as their new DPS. Maybe going hard with the Reaper leaving the Bastion behind to do dick out some damage. It's only popping the ult early, and it's wow. Portal combat, combat, Doi picking up two. Early Bastion artillery strike is a pretty standard practice at this point. You drop it early, you force out immortality, your team's able to go in, or you drop it early and no one's ready for it, and they end up getting deleted with the follow-up damage. UTD here now, they have a ton of volts online. Looks like West Texas is gonna try and go through main, but they're gonna get caught by the jumper team. The response is Kitsune Rush, but don't think Suzu landed on people that were in the rampage. Three goes down to the side of West Texas, and now it's time to bring out the mops and play cleanup crew for UTD. It's another fight in their favor. We have entered last by territory. Juice Box being the last one to die makes getting this touch difficult. It's going to be Icarus swapping over to that wrecking ball, looking to get a couple of pixels into the collision box with point. Gets bullied by the Lucio first. Waiting for that last oh. percentage to get a touch, finds it, but Pugo, Kashir, Kashir, and Doi all pick up one. Icarus goes down to phone. The last player left standing is Mommy on the Reaper. Can't even make it into point. That's Village going over to UTD. UTD, similar to the, the match with uh, St. Clair, just always going first, always being the ones to set the tempo and it's really making it so West Texas can't prepare. 
I said it in game game one. It's the team that ult first, the team that ults first is likely to win the fight. It means you have a plan, or you're just going a little ballistic and you're like, eh, screw it. I'm just gonna hit the Q button. And it looks like in order to see our favorite map, we have to Five, have four, the side of West three, Texas AM two, went out here on Sanctum one, in order for us to move on. So I didn't think we do see any environmental this time around. Because that's the UTV to either shut the door here on the control point and send us over to hybrid. Or for West Texas, post up, close, and set the pace to go into a third map. It's here on the jump rat, pummeling damage to the front doorway. Axe has been used from Icarus. Scout also for full supports and Symmetra all go down for the use side of West Texas. And then Icarus is soon to follow, as is Karma. I really like the read from UTD there, going the Junkrat this time around. Just able to spam him through the chokes. And it's really strong into those Junker Queen comps, which they predicted this time around. Fashion turret form coming out from West Texas. Already on cooldown again. Shout turret come out from UTD. Around the corner, they pick up three. Icarus does pick up Kashir. The losing one player and taking out everybody else is A-OK -okay if you're looking at UTD right now. Kashir took a, a, a very hard off angle there in their spawn, and he did go down for it, but the damage was already done. All of West Texas was turned around, and UTD ran straight in. We'll see them switch to the Orisa. The off angle is going uncontested, is able to get damage out to pick up Icarus, does find Karma thereafter. That's three down for the side of West Texas and back to the spawn room if you're pushed up towards the fountain. Juicebox falls, slight stagger on the Lucio. Fashion is forward and once again, not scared of anybody. Yeah, great angles being taken from UPD. Once again, Kashir just so far to the side, there's only so much that can punish him on West Texas without a long rotate. Kitsune Rush, Rampage, everyone goes down to the side of West Texas. He do have that Kiriko, which is just the prediction of needing to use these Suzu's. It's coming a little bit too early or too late. West Texas can't even lose leave spawn with phone using the bastional and now there's only 87 percent on the clock they have to make a point somehow looks like the is looking for the lucio the only hope to touch but the ball on this side of the actually does make it through With that, UTD is going to walk away from map one. Nepal on a 2-0 victory and send us over to hybrid. Now the question is, are we going to see Kings Row again? I don't know. But we've got Puggo coming in with the play of the game on JQ. Any of one of those rampages could have been play of the game here. And it's actually going to be walking in first fight here on Sanctum and deleting almost everybody. A little bit of help Junkrat and back. Yeah, just so much damage coming in through that doorway in a tight room against Junkrat. Orbs flying everywhere, the Bastion nade. You see Junkrat and you see a Bastion and you're in a small corridor, get out. Like, yeah. Junkrat has so much power, the, you're dodging any Junkrat mines is just borderline impossible. Take a different route. It, I am so sorry that you had to meet Kashir's Junkrat on Nepal. Now, with that being said, out of all of the hybrid maps, if you were to give advice over to Texas A&M right now, which one would you say you should go? I'd say they should try and take a gamble, go like Blizzard World, try and go a poke comp, see if they can turn things around on that one. See? I'm not absolutely crazy saying don't pick King's Row every single time. I know Jacob asked something similar of you in the last series, but you know... I'm just going to continue to support the narrative of maybe we don't go King's Row, but we'll find out ultimately what the side of Texas A&M decides to go with. It is going to be their map pick. Once again, it is hybrid. So we're waiting on word from production regarding that. If it is King's Row, we'll likely see something similar to what we just witnessed. So.
that being said, it's going to end up being Texas A&M able to pick map, which means UTD picks sides. I mean, considering their comfort on almost, well, on their compositions, if it is King's Row, I wouldn't be shocked if we actually see them attack first. Yeah, I, uh, to be honest, based off of that, I, I'd expect UTD to pick defense. Just, uh, I bet they're feeling real confident. Probably just wanting to get the match over quick. I, I know a lot of teams have that philosophy. And so, because they did so well on that cost map, I could easily see a defense pick here. Yeah, and it looks like, oh, no, I'm getting teased with more Nepal footage on my left. So no confirmation yet on to which map we'll be picking. Matt has suggested Blizzard World. And there it is. I am not at all surprised. Here we go again. It's King's Row. And I'm going to follow suit with also what Matt was talking about earlier. Yes, UTD likely to pick defense first. And that will put them at serious point as we move into flashpoint. Defending first is an optimal strategy, especially if you're feeling confident. Attacking first, if you're struggling, though, sometimes works out. But it really depends on what your comfort composition is and how much information you have on the enemy team. We're about to jump into the start of King's Row for map two. And if you're just jumping in and joining us, currently UTD is winning in our series. Um, Nepal, they 2 owed. So let's see if they full hold here on defense, or they did miraculously choose to shake things up and attack. They get all three points. After all, King's Row is an all or nothing. Don't normally see us stopping in street phase. Yeah, usually you either get full held or you end up full capping. No in between. So I'll have to see how it goes out, how the attack goes. It is a really good map to snowball on, of course. I do. I, I think since the transition from Overwatch 1 to 2 and we dropped the second tank, you know, the day when King's Row, you could have one composition for a first point, and then Street Phase, you had another, and then when we went to the Optic Factory, you swapped to another comp. Those are long gone. The snowball ability is, I think, even worse because of that. Yeah, and I don't know. There's only so much that you can do to prevent the spam on your walk up on defense now that there's only one tank. Typically, you'd have the off tank pressure some of it out. Now that doesn't exist. All off tank players need in, in joint unison, and I can definitely say this is most likely UTD on defense. One. Yeah, based off how they're setting up, I would assume so. Roadhog Life Weaver. This is intriguing to say the least. Land a hook and then hook your hog back and take them all the way with you. going to choose to flip it. No point in trying to force it down, especially when it's going to take a long rotation for the heroes that UTD has decided to pick. With the Widowmaker dying earlier, it looks like UTD is trying to spawn camp. The Widow who's now swapped the capacity. coming out from West Texas. They've managed to get one tick and counting. That life we've rolled such an uphill battle to get an Elan through the There's so much healing, so much over health. Kachir did pick up a two-piece combo with the jump rat tire. Ikari gonna commit the oh. oh that was that was tragic. Not what he was looking for, but still the rest of UTD is falling to the GPS. Looking to clutch this up still though, the beat comes out from West Texas. 
Sun was expunged by Doi and is unsuccessful. Kashir goes down. I think it's time to swap off the funny comp, Dallas. UT Dallas is going to swap over to a more cohesive comp, slightly. Slightly. <laughs> Tago is choosing to go JQ, which makes sense. The Roadhog is not going to fully work out in what West Texas is brought to the table. However, we're keeping this Life Weaver, which is... I'm confused about, we'll have to see, is playing for the grip game really what UTD is relying on? If it is, that can be very discombobulating if you are on the receiving end of it. As phone goes down early, playing and overstaying their welcome on cart. You do see the Cassidy goes down, Puggo goes down. That's most likely going to be West Texas forced back, but Kashir's on the high ground and is not getting pressured. He's gonna look for the 1v1 against the Kitiko, most likely just gonna switch step and run away. He's UPD is taking a, a lot of interesting 1v1 angles and West Texas was doing a pretty good job at punching. Time around, just waiting for respawns a little bit. A great pull from Icarus, but another great pull from Mallard. Reaper just went on a journey over on the right side. I think walked completely through. West Texas didn't shoot, but was stomping. Not going to be caught out. Free life is popped, forcing back everyone from West Texas. We see a yoink on the karma from Puggo. Karma's going to get deleted. Yeah, when that tree of life comes out, West Texas tried to kite. Reminiscent of Overwatch 1 rally. Just so hard to get an Elam through. So you see them trying to avoid it, but that pull was great from Puggo. This time, if they don't scout the high ground, the Reaper could get a surprise death blossom. Looks like he may have been spotted out. Not to mention trying to force oh. Archway against the Junkrat. It's very painful. We do hear Deadeye from West Texas is going to be used. Captive Sun in response to Doi. Kashir uses Tire, picks up two. Phone walks in, finds one. Doi finds another. Puggo picks up Karma, and that's a team wipe for UTD. West Texas, they are building that Junker Queen ult, and it's going to be really strong against UT Dallas. The only thing they really have to do anything about it is that pull, and it has to be timed perfectly because remember, it doesn't cleanse. It just makes you invulnerable for a little bit. And they use it early. Oh, but the death drop. Oh! Bosom gave him the time to reset that cooldown and take this fight with a different approach. Enjoying the view? Huh. Here they come. Optimus Fall. Team <laughs> and grab both stations on high ground. This time West Texas is going for a different approach, but because of the special wide angle, Reaper is not going to be spotted until unfortunately the loss of boost box. Icarus goes down to Kashir as well. Puggo will find Karma. And it looks like Cole did find phone, so one elimination was given over to the side of West Texas. And forgetting that elimination is huge when UTD is trying to spawn camp. Now they're down to a 4v5 if they want to take the fight here. Which is obviously not favorable, so they're going to back up a little bit. Try and buy some time. It's coming out on the side of West Texas. They're able to find one. And both taking the rise together, and it actually ends up making Icarus avoid the counter queen. Ult. What? Phone got two. Icarus gets Doi. It's always terrible when your own Life Weaver ends up giving a pedal to the enemy team. It's helpful. You see Puggo go down to Juice Box. Kashir goes down to Icarus. It takes down Icarus. Kashir does die to Cole. Texas a and finally getting payload progress, rounding library. A closer respawn on the side of West Texas really helped him in that fight. There were a lot of trades. Bone taking an angle which he's not seen, but it looks like the captain mm. pocket. Please spot out that Reaper. Spot phone out. Stop oh, and the Sonic comes through. And yeah. Higher from the spawn. It's going to require a perfect Suzu if they want to live through this. Hanzo goes down. Kashir is eliminated by Karma's aerial strike. We hear Captive Sun is also initiated. Doi and Puggo both pick up one apiece. The grip comes on to Puggo to take Puggo to high ground. 
Bone finds Karma. I believe it's just this Reinhardt left standing on point. And that's the end of round one in West Texas A&M's attack. It was a great grip from that life weaver there. It looked like Pugo was about to fall. So low HP, and the Bastion was beaming him. Bone is getting away with so much. Living rent-free in places he needs to pay something for. West Texas is learning to check those angles now that phone has taken him, you know, so often in this match. But sometimes it's difficult for them to clear it out because UTD is engaging while they're trying to. Let's see what competition both teams decide to roll out on. It does look like side of UTD. I couldn't really get a glimpse of the silhouette outlines that we were able to see. Didn't see anything funny, but I also did not see the tank spawn in yet, so possibly a discussion of composition. Looks like we got Kiko Genji. Oh, Genji might be swapping. Dash backwards in the spawn. Let's see what ends up happening for the side of Texas a and Kiko's definitely staying. Perhaps a Doomfist, but... Oh. Oh boy. A lot of people like to do picks they're not really going to stick on in the spawn room on attack. They like to really mess with casters. Five, yeah. Four, so we'll three, have to see two, the Sigma one. shield coming out. Attackers incoming. So we'll be sticking to it. You were correct. There is no Genji for the side of West Texas. Juice oh. box is going to go down. West Texas is running the Soldier Sojourn. With the Sigma, someone has to choose the contest point unless they're going to go with the two pick and then press because they just lose one of their supports early on. However, Icarus goes down and ended up losing Cole as well. Most likely, a back off, give up, reconvene, and try to hold Bookstore. An underrated combo, I would say, is that Life Weaver and the Doom Fist. It allows the Doom Fist to use all of the cooldowns and still have a way to escape. Yes. Most definitely her Doom Fist can go in, hit every ability, and then scream, grip me. However, uh, we've seen the May swap into the arena. That is Doom Fist full charge because of Icarus, and there wasn't follow up with the oh, but the Going boop. to spear spin and the Cassidy swap in order to add the hinder. Pugo goes down. That's up one right now for West Texas. Hart's not at Archway yet. They can theoretically go forward. West Texas on the Cassidy and Soldier have to be so careful of the Widowmaker at all times, any moment. Watch their head. Building the Empowered Punch so easily. That's Suzu Yu's Pugo can hit the Meteor Strike whenever he sees this. Goes in the back line after Yari. Yari's going to use Captive Sun. Doesn't look like it landed on Kashir and Kashir alone. However, two are already down for the side of Texas A&M. And now it's just the DPS who are actually coming back from spawn still. Yeah, and they're going to have to cross into a, a deadly sight line of this May, Iliari, Life Weaver. And the wall comes up to even block him from touching. Barely make it, but the mail comes online if they don't have Suzu. Suzu was online, but Cassidy didn't get it. PD go to jump off point. UTD walks away map to victory, which means we're moving on to flashpoint. We have predicted going to... Oh, well, wait, first let's give the player their moments. It's Kashir coming in on the Widowmaker for the play of the game. Yeah. One, a whiff, possibly another after that. I believe so. Yes. Oh. Uh, oh. Cancel. So that's play of the game over to the Widowmaker, and we've predicted now twice that we'd end up on New Junk City. <laughs> Are we gonna keep betting on Black? I mean, the second you you change your choice, I gotta think about this. I'm going with Servasa. I'm sticking with New Junk City. At least one of us has to be right yeah, this time around. This time one of us will be. Whether it's you or me, that's ultimately up to the teams. Now, based off of what we've seen coming out from the side of UTV, I don't know if going Servasa is the way to go because I feel like 
just the dynamic of playing the off tanks more frequently works out more on Sarasa, and plus Doomfist can throw people off the map, so. I just think, since we've seen it so often, something tells me players might prefer it, sort of a King's Row sort of situation. Last week it was New Junk City. Oh. Yeah. Now I'm scared. Now I'm exactly. getting nervous. Exactly. So I'm sticking with the New Junk City call. I don't know if that's going to be the case. We're going to get confirmation from production here. Actually, we are receiving it right now, I believe. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. I'm normally wrong when it comes to these map predictions. It is going <laughs> to be Servasa. So Matt was correct. One angle. Switch it up. I almost stuck to my guns, but then I remembered there's a whole fallacy named after that. I don't believe in sunk costs. Ah, uh, that's true. And we are seeing a quick replay of how things played out on map one for the first map of Village Nepal. And we do have confirmation. Pugo is coming out, and Derpy is coming in for UTD. So likely going to see some Reinhardt play. Things are going to get a little bit silly. I'm excited. I'm not so sure if West Texas is ready. Derpy. Some people say he's a Ryan one trick, but he does say he's proficient on Sigma. And let's just say there was one moment, May 26, where that he was. Uh, one moment, OK. But that was one time. So let's just say there were, uh, well, there was once two tank players on UTD, Abdallah and Derpy. And even though one's an off tank, one might have done better than the other. And it wasn't the off tank. All right, I'll take your word for that one. Um, Derpy, I do still foresee most likely playing the Reinhardt character for this one. I mean, would you really predict a team to roll out on Sigma no. for Flashpoint? No, I'm just going based off what he says. OK, so insider information. <laughs> Derpy claims to be able to play Sigma one time. But we were most <laughs> likely going to see Reinhardt for this next map, we'll have to wait and see. And it looks like Derpy is not going to be in. Instead, it's going to be no. Strider? Is that Strider coming? I think Strighton. Strighton? All right. Sorry, Derpy. I'll catch you on Twitch when you're live when I am not trying to do my homework at some point. With that being said, now I don't know what to think. Yeah, that threw me off. Our camera operator right now just gave us the big, I am trying my best right now. I totally understand. UTD, you guys are getting a little creative. I'm interested to see how that ends up working out, whether or not you end up getting punished. We'll have to end up seeing how this one goes. And we are about to jump into Servasa. Best of luck. UTD subbing in their, or subbing Sub out their, their sub. sub. Yeah. I love you guys, we're here. It's a big roster, making sure everyone gets the right time. How it goes. Okay, so for this first flashpoint, what do you think is more important? Reaching the checkpoint first or getting to optimal positioning? I think optimal positioning. It reminds me of uh, the Nepal elephant map, specifically you kind of take the outside angle and you wrap around the point a little bit. I see that a lot on this map. A lot of people will fight for that outside so that they can, you know, have that natural cover and just spam into the point for the other team trying to force it. I find, I mean, just what we've seen standing in a doorway on any of these flashpoints, you are funneling all the damage into you, whereas if you're the team on the outside, you're able to just pummel damage. And if you get pushed, Oh no, you hit your S key and you walk away. Yeah. And oh. it does look like we are having some malfunctions happening. It's Overwatch, small indie company, things happen. It'll only be a moment before we are back into game. And it looks like everyone is ready to go. So we're going to jump back into Servasa and see how well these two teams match up on our newest map type of Flashpoint. If UTD walks away with a victory here, that is it. They slam the door, say goodnight, hit their heads on their pillows, and go to sleep. 
But if West Texas walks away with victory here on Flashpoint, that is going to send us into push. So West Texas, the cards are all in your hands. I mean, Matt no longer bet on black in this instance and was correct, so maybe it's time for you guys to also bet it on black. Well, not bet it on black. Don't follow what I think we should be doing at all. Don't follow my map calls. Obviously, you didn't. Servas is your go-to. Personally, I want to see an environmental. Whether or not that comes to fruition is up to you guys. But Matt said it here. I agree. Positions over points. Win the fights, then take the objective. Play to your strengths. Obviously the same starting point every time. Both teams are prepping for that one. See what comp they come up with. Taking our beautiful cinematic route in through Servasa. This is the very first checkpoint. The awkwardly placed Mega Pack that, if you know it's there, it's nice. If you forget that it exists, well, I'm sorry for you and your health bar. Yeah, I just found that out right now. This man plays more Overwatch than I do, by the way. Good to know it's there. Looks like we will see an unexpected Five, Junker four, Queen comp from three, at least one of the teams. Two. Unexpected in air quotes for me personally for CTD that's running out of JQ on JQ because of the amount of sustain she provides plus the amount of speed you can get being extremely powerful on this one. It is West Texas rolling with it and phone is on Reinhardt. Disrespectful to not let there be come in on the Reinhardt map. I agree. Phone, you better post up. If I don't see a huge shatter, I'm going to be disappointed. And Derby, you better be disappointed. I'm totally good. But nonetheless, Best of luck to both these teams as we engage here on point one. Mommy on the Genji is looking at Lifeweaver. Dash is used from Lifeweaver. Genji gets oh. the 13 health and meets Bones Hammer. That is the first elimination going in favor of UTD. I'm looking for a it hits the wall. I will say, West Texas comp is really good against UT Dallas, just allowing them to surround UTD. They have to get close to do damage for most of the characters on UTD, not the Widowmaker, of course. You see Miss Olivia from Texas A&M go down. Icarus found phone, so no tank for UTD right now. I will say something I missed. I didn't notice Doi was on Widow. Yeah, Pugo has gone over to the Yari, and we have Kashir out and striking in for Junkrat play this time. I have to see how they compare. Pure Strike. Strike gets a pick early, though. No Genji oh. for West Texas. Goosebox comes in on Doi after Tracer had done a disgusting amount of damage without Widow giving any care to them. The Widow's gone. Miss Olivia once again from West Texas, unfortunately, is back in oh. the spawn room. There's a shatter onto Icarus. No Suzu to save you. Phone gets the elimination onto Icarus. Cole yeah. goes down to Millard. And that is another reset for West Texas A&M. UTD Junkrat tire online, and once again, when you're running that Kiwiko against Junkrat, it's so hard to survive just because you have to time it perfectly, as opposed to BAP, where you have a little bit of leeway with the immortality. Going to this next fight. A deadly Junkrat tire coming up. We have Captain Sun, both for UTD. But Texas A&M has Rampage online, Beat, as well as Kitsune Rush shortly thereafter for Miss Olivia. We hear Beat get dropped. Icarus uses the Rampage. Follow-up damage looking for the Reinhardt who gets gripped oh. and pulled to high ground by the Life Weaver. Just waited out that anti-grenade, or er, anti from the junk, Junker Queen on the high ground. Until he was able to fight back on point again. West Texas swapping up their comp. Winton. A little bit of Winton here. All right. I don't know how I feel about the Cassidy swap, though. I feel like if you're switching on to that Winton, the Tracer, Tracer could have been just as strong. Yeah, the follow-up, the ability to actually coordinate where you can pull attention to why you're to get it. I see the value. Cassidy, you're getting dove a lot. I can understand the hinder being the name of the game, but here you're just looking for damage from long range. We don't have a lot of mobility. We do see Puggo go down to Icarus and Lucio, though. So have some dynam dynamic combo is the intent of Icarus and Juice Box and everyone else just needs to live. Icarus does go down, though. Great rail from Billy. 
bone with the Earth Shatter is taking an interesting angle around the point. Earth Shatter comes out. Bones on one, but oh. ends up getting deleted after Shatter. Blade comes out. Grip wow. was used. This Genji is slicing and dicing, but unfortunately is crying because they're slicing nothing but onions. Nothing with the blade. Strixton manages to find Genji. Tree of Life is going to get procced on point. Pugo goes down. Lucio's trying to race in, but unfortunately will not make it. Icarus is gone. Miss Olivia also gone. And that's point cap. Over to YouTube the 44% for West Texas. Yeah, and 44% is a lot on these kind of game modes. I mean, if, if West Texas caps the point, UTD gets maybe one fight, and that's it. If they lose that, point will go into West Texas' hands. Really though, with the Sojournal, almost both DPS ults online, it's gonna be really hard for West Texas to survive. The beat isn't quite online if UTD goes before they get it. We'll have to see. Anderson low, dash is out. And here Captain Sun from Pugo, Deuce Box goes down, so oh. there goes the saving grace of that hit Lucio beat if they manage to get it online. Cole is down, Icarus is down, Mommy has gone down, Miss Olivia is the final one to get eliminated. That's a team kill for UTD. This point's most likely on lock. Don't think anyone will be able to make it in. Juice Box did go down first, so trying to make it in by yourself is always rough on these points. And it's going to be going to last. Oh, Ooh, we have a primal, primal to make it in from Icarus, the hero play. If they take down this Lucio, it removes an ult. And there they go. Higher. Australian's not finding quite the value Kashir was with the with the ultimate. I'll say that. That was another team kill, but we need to accommodate for that. Yes, West Texas used Primal Rage and Miss Olivia also used Kitsune Rush, but we have Deadeye, we have Beat, almost close to Blade for West Texas A and M. In the gritty. <laughs> for the side of UTD, everything was burned. All the cues that they had definitely utilized to secure that point. Puggo's 50% oh. to ult. The flanking Junkrat. Oh no, Junkrats. Where's he going? Where is he going? At first it was a flank, now he's just leaving. I think he lost track of where the point was. Tree of Life and Captain Sun are going to be online here very soon. Cole goes down for the side of West Texas, so no Cassidy there. Strixton does go down to the Genji. He's going off on an adventure, and who knows where that was. There was no map in sight for Strixton on the Junkrat. Icarus on the Doomfist, though. Lots of cooldowns have been used. Oh. Counter charges Reinhardt. Will phone live? Phone will as Icarus has chosen to get out. Genji goes down to the side of West Texas. I do like the Doomfist swap. It gives you a little bit of CC to deal with the Reinhardt a little bit more. Wow, the overhealth from the tree is so hard to damage through once again. Okay. Powered Punch is countercharged by Phone here. And now Puggo is going to have his own Yariel for this last fight. West Texas does have beat to respond as well as DPS ults of their own. But the healing, the pull, it's going to be hard for, for them to get value out of that blade in high noon. Well, what if Genji gets the deflect on the Captain Sun? Could happen. It's, it's not too rare. It is a huge projectile, but it looks like UPD is taking the fight early. It's going to split West Texas as some of them are at least going to have to touch point. Oh! oh. Doi? Doi has to hit those. He comes out. Oh! Oh, Lucio lives because the of the overhaul. Yeah, the overhaul from Beat. There's Captive Sun, Puggo mm. and Phone both got one. Icarus found the Lord. Icarus goes down to Strixton, who's come back from spawn. Phone finds Mommy, and with that, West Texas is gone off the point. That's a team wipe. Flashpoint is going to go over to UTD. That's a 3-0 victory perfect score for Dallas. Really well played from UTD, showing off their flexibility. Playing many roles as different, different players. Joy was playing the game on Sojourn. Moments after this, I'm pretty sure we saw Doi lose a duel with the Cassidy who had much less health. And may have been standing still because he was high noon.
the words of Matt Merck, you got to hit those doy. But nonetheless, congratulations, UTD. You are going to walk away with your undefeated record intact, 3 0 in here for, uh, against West Texas A&M for week three. With that being said, we are going to take a quick break before we jump into an interview with the side of UTD. I do believe it'll be Puggo joining us for a quick conversation about how that whole series felt for their team. So don't go anywhere. Back here in just a few minutes with more Naystar League action and an interview. See you in a little bit.
the studio for our interview. Hello, Pago. Thank you so much for joining us for this interview. Thank you for having me. All right, so I gotta ask, and if you didn't anticipate this one, <laughs> I'm sorry, but honestly, Kings Row point one defense, what were y'all thinking with that composition you rolled out, rolled out on? Uh, we weren't thinking at all, to be honest. Uh, we just decided to play some different type of comps because we did not want to leak our real strats. And so I just rolled out with the hog, but then I got eviscerated by the other team. I couldn't do anything. Yes, yeah, that was a... It was quite the uh, slaughterhouse a little bit on your road hog for the beginning, but you guys definitely shaped up and fixed things. I see what y'all are doing in the background, you silly gooses. Anyway, so Kings Row, you guys definitely oh managed God. to shave things up, and then we moved on to Servasa. But Matt, <laughs> what question do you have here for Buggo? Yeah, we saw a lot of flanking Junkrat plays from you guys. I wanted to ask how much of that was uh, communicated and how much of that was uh, someone going off the plan. <laughs> ah, yes. Kosh, Kosh, my good teammate. He never comes. He never comes whenever he does that. So <laughs> we just try to plan it out ourselves with the rest of the team, you know, but we never know when he's going to backline, that's why he died so many times that map is... So yeah, but there's your answer. In other words, Junkrat got what he deserved for going off script a little bit. With that being said, Pago, do you have any quick shout outs you'd like to give friends, family, anyone you want to give a quick hello to, and we can get you out of here on that? I want to give a shout out to my favorite coach, P3T9L, Pedal. The greatest alive, the greatest out there, to be honest. And the rest of my team, uh, I don't really like them that much. Okay. I want to give them a shout out. So thank you for having me. All right. Thank you so much for joining us for a quick interview, Pugo. Hope you have a wonderful rest of your evening. And for those of you still watching, we have one more series to go here for the Nace Star League. Uh, fall series tonight for week three, so don't go anywhere. We'll take a quick break. We'll be back here with more Overwatch 2 action in just a little bit. One angle with the man. You can use the teleport gives him a lot of options. Does not may wall what you want to use to wall someone off and delete. Unfortunately, gets deleted by a Bastion who has removed two players from the playing field and cashier will find one more doi will find one and bone find going hard with the reaper leaving the bastion behind to do stick out some damage he's only popping the ult early and it's wow Portal combat combat doi picking up two early bastion artillery strike once again not scared of anybody Great angles being taken from UTD. Once again, Kashir just so far to the side. There's only so much that can punish him on West Texas without a long rotate. Kashir did pick up a two-piece combo with the Junkrat, Tire Icarus. 
Gotta commit the oh. oh! That was... That was tragic. Not what he was looking for, but still, the rest of UPD is falling to the DPS. Anzo goes down. Sheer is eliminated by Karma's aerial strike. We hear Captive Sun is also initiated. Doi and Puggo exactly. both pick up one apiece. The grip comes on the Puggo to take Puggo to high ground. Bone finds Karma. I believe it's just this Reinhardt left standing on point. And that's the end of round one. Yes. Most definitely, her Jesus can go in, hit every ability, and then scream, grip me. However, uh, we've seen the May swap into the arena. That is his full charge as there is, and there wasn't follow up with the oh, but the He's going to spear spin and the Cassidy swap in order to add the hinder. Puggo goes down. That's up one right now. It's Olivia. We hear beat get dropped. Icarus uses the rampage. Follow up damage looking for the Reinhardt who gets gripped oh. and pulled to high ground by the Life Weaver. Just waited out that anti grenade or anti from the junk junker queen on the high ground. What if Genji gets the deflect on the Captain Sun? Could happen. It's it's not too rare. It is a huge projectile, but it looks like UPD's taking the fight early. It's gonna split West Texas as some of them are at least gonna have to touch points. Oh, oh. Doi? Doi has to hit.
She's got a gun in her bag and she's waiting. 
Looking for answers, but I'm blinded by the lights. Lost in the music, and I stay here for the night. I promise I'll be gone in the morning, out of sight and out of
to the Nay Star League studio. We have just one more Overwatch match for you today, and for this match, we move out of the varsity division and into the open division. The University of San Francisco is getting ready to go to battle against UNLV. So we started in the east, and we've been gradually moving over to the west. And of course, time zones and the way everything's scheduled to count for that kind of really these teams. But these are two teams that. In the open division, not as many matches. A lot of the varsity teams having two zero records or have basically been playing for two weeks. But these teams have a one and zero oh and one and zero oh record, so they've only played one game. So these teams are a little bit fresher out of the box. I mean, also we talked about this whole idea of you know getting that perfect record from the very beginning and holding on to it all throughout the very end. A, that's a lot of games to play perfectly. Don't hold it against yourself. B, it's just the beginning, so you falter a little bit in the beginning. That's your baseline. It's only up from there. If you start at the very top and then all of a sudden you start to lose, that's going to feel a lot worse than, you know, your first game was a back and forth, ended up being, you know, you, you lost, but then from there, games improved, you started winning. It's much more of a fulfilling storyline from that perspective. Well, three teams that have already competed today have kept their winning records and keep on going toward a perfect season. First, we had Ashland University go up against Kentucky, and Kentucky won that one 3-1. to one. Then St. Clair and UT Dallas won their matches 3-0. to zero. Now we move on to University of San Francisco, the Dons, who have a 0-1 record, and then UNLV, who have a 1-0 record. So could be a chance for one team to pull way out ahead, or they might be ending tonight both at 1-1. One, one we go into University of San Francisco, private university, I'm told, out of San Francisco. The Dons are made up of Angst, Envious, Ponky, the Helper, and Baguette. I, I hope you play Brigitte Baguette. I really hope you do, because I always used to call Brigitte Baguette. And then for the side of UNLV, we have Hey Doggo, Curtain Master, Omniflorp, Hertz, and Quarty for the side of the Rebels. And UNLV is a close friend of our organization, as well as someone that has, uh, this organization has visited this facility multiple times and has left us with a token. And that token is actually Hey Doggo's jersey. Wanted to give you a shout out. We do hang on to these. And if you ever come to visit this facility, please do give us your jerseys. We love to have them. It's a token of friendship. We'll give you one yourself. Maybe all the players can sign it so you can keep a record of the generations to come for the esports facilities. And we'll get it hung up on the wall. So thank you so much, Hey Doggo, for giving us that token. And we hope to see you again in the future. But for now, we hope to see you pop off in this game. And if you don't, the other team's going to pop off themselves. Speaking of the other team, quick correction. I realize now it's most likely Envious is the name that I had trouble with. It's like Envious. But slight twist on it like a lot of gamer tags have. So I'm told we are going back to Li Jean for this first stage, which we have talked a lot about. We covered it pretty in depth at the beginning of the night. Yes, and so with that in mind, we can try to theorize about the lineups we'll be bringing out, but I will be honest, UNLV is known for their creativity. They like to make a composition that is, to be blunt, the clockwork meta of the college scene. They don't like to play to the meta every single time, but currently right now, I do think Cordy has the opportunity to definitely pop off on JQ or pop off on the Zarya picks. However, I want to see a duel of the battle cattle. I want to go to Barnyard and see which horse is the strongest. But if that doesn't end up happening, of course I understand. Not everyone likes to play Orisa, but for those that main her, it's always, if you don't got the giddy, giddy out of my way. So. We'll have to wait and see what these teams decide on for Li Zhang, depending on which submap we end up on. If we start out on Gardens, of course we can end, well on Night Market we can anticipate the TP on Gardens. We can get a little bit more creative and for Control Point, most likely going to be Brawl-centric compositions. I like your idea of a barnyard battle. The battle of old Bessie and old Jesse. And one of them can live, but the other has to be put out to pasture. Well, there was a time in Overwatch 2 where, you know, there was a lot of horse and there was a lot, a lot of Roadhog play. I called that barnyard meta. If you saw a hog, you went a horse. If you saw a horse, you could go hog or you could go horse. That was it. It was cow or pig. And that's where it ended. Sue Wei! Exactly. Someone had to get it sent out to pasture, and it was, just, it was whichever tank was just not willing to adopt their play style to counter the other one. Now we are taking a quick look at gardens. Hopefully, we have avoided the, the uh, trip into the drink for most teams thus far. Any, no multi-boops from any support players just yet, but we have seen boops come from Lucio's and Doomfist alike on 
control center. You got to respect the space, respect the abilities of the enemy team, know what they have, and don't just walk over to the coastline. And it seems we don't only have a barnyard uh, meta, but we have barnyard internet right now as we're just waiting for all the issues to be set aside. Of course, sometimes you can load in with the wrong settings, but it's all good. But I am thrilled. I do hope we start out on gardens because that is my personal favorite. Just you, you know me. I'm, I'm pretty one note when it comes to my map preferences. Yes, if there's an opportunity for someone to be sent off the map into oblivion and for them to regret their choice to path that way, not recognizing there was a spear, a doomfist punch, a Lucio sound wave coming at their face, of course, Jacob will celebrate and enjoy that. I personally, not the biggest fan because I hate seeing it happen after many many years at this point of crying at people to stop doing it because you're serving yourself up on a silver platter. With that being said, I personally love Night Market. It is a battle of who can get their composition and the rollout executed the fastest, and that takes practice. Many teams make a mistake, someone gets left behind, and that is where people start to falter. And Also, I love seeing teams be able to make it back when the TP composition doesn't work out or their TP gets broken too quickly and rectifying their wrongs and winning out the first fight. Of course, there's still the opportunity for a brood, so I'm still happy. Yes, there is. It's just a little bit harder. Mm -hmm. If you're choosing to back off all the way to the edge of Night Market and you get booped, that is, honestly, that is your own undoing. Or if you're playing on the left or right lanes and get booped off, you, you should honestly just be a little bit careful pathing on those edges, unless you're a tank. As we talked about with Matt Merck earlier, the tank passive comes in clutch and makes you a little bit less scared of a Lucio booping you off the map now because you don't get booped as far. Hopefully as we go into reload, we'll still have the same order of stages, but anything's up in the air. We could change it around. Just have to wait and see if you have any predictions as to the exact hero. I mean, you sort of mentioned both both horses, but is there anyone else? I mean, most okay. likely we might see Zarya. Okay, so if, if just based off of what we know, from both these teams, I think most likely UNLV is going to roll out on the horse. And then I do think that San Francisco is going to roll out attemptive. Actually, no, flip that. Side of UNLV is going to roll out, roll out on JQ, and then San Francisco is going to roll out on the horse. Okay. I'm sticking to it, and if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Unlike Matt, I do fall into the sunk fallacy, the, the sunk cost fallacy, I am willing to do it because the only thing that is on the line here is my sanity because I guess everything wrong every single time. And here we go. We're into the first match. It's the Dons versus the Rebels. I got to say, I'm very intimidated by both these teams' Round logos. One. They're both guys in hats staring down at me. The Dons logo reminds me of Zoro. Ah, if anyone okay. has seen the movies from the 90s. And that is a risky teleport from San Francisco. Oh, that is a teleport away you with don't it. do. UNLV, I cannot believe you let them get away with that. Now this bunch of fighting on point. Javelin's going to be thrown out. The Doomfist dodges it. Hey, Doggo gets a pick onto Angst. Monkey's the next to fall. Envious also. There's only one left, and they soon just go off the edge so that they can respawn as a complete group. UNLV, the Rebels, are going to be taking the point first off. Got a pretty healthy charge up on two of the heroes already. Past 50% in just one fight. Omniflark and old Hey Doggo. Getting close. I think we could be seeing a nano blade in the draw out in just one fight. Ah, that nano blade, I, I love it and I also hate it. It's an all or nothing ultimate. It costs two, and if you fail, your team is going to be in hot water. But that's a huge anti coming out from Hey Doggo. We do see Hertz get forced back with the Spear Spin and Spear. Both cooldowns, all three cooldowns from Baguette have been used. Ooh. Confirms the deletion of Team Master. Now, it does look like the poor, poor Bassy on their team is gone. Hey Doggo gets deleted, and it looks like they just gave up too much space. They let the Barnyard in, they open the doors, and University of San Francisco says if you're not going to force us to use cooldowns, we'll take the space for free. Thank you. UNLV just has their Nano Blade online should they choose to go that direction. They'll also have a Meteor Strike and a Beast. Any damage that might be pushed up from this window might be able to counter it. Antony is going to be thrown out on the U of San Francisco. And Hertz is going to bring out his Blade. They're going to be going with the Nano Blade combo. It only really manages to pick up Angst. Terror Surge used in response by Baguette. 
Javelin has been on point for U of San Francisco, but UNLV is going to win the fight in the end. For the next fight, we're going to have Cordy come up with the Meteor Strike as well as Keen Master with that beat. Unfortunately, no one on the side of San Francisco is going to have ults online, but we do see Angst is going to swap over to the Sojourn. And Anibus is swapping to Genji, and we have Baguette going with the Doomfist. So trying to match QWERTY on the Doomfist. Really interesting, this composition's borderline identical, but the attention pulling, the resource pulling that Tracer has from Omniflark could be the, the deal breaker here, as Angst on Sojourn does not have that type of pressure created, just spamming down, but the deletion of people is strong. We do see Angst go down, Pokey goes down, Hurt also is going to get deleted, followed up by the Helper and Anibus and there as well from University of San Francisco. It's just Baguette standing. Doomfist left to just do his thing in an enclosed space. Spells doom for the Dons, and UNLV is going to claim the first map. I gave Jacob a look for that pun. I had to. It actually was more serendipitous. I just, as I was saying it, I realized how well it went together. Yeah, I agree. Also, nice alliteration. I'm, I'm here for it. We do see the duel of the Doomfists in here. Not quite the duel of the Fates, the Sith Lords that we had earlier with the full charge Zarya beams on these maps. But we are going to be going to my favorite map of Night Market. It does offer the ability to have some environmental kills, not as frequently as the Gardens does. So Jacob got his wish. There wasn't so many people thrown into the drink, but now it's my turn. I do anticipate the f seeing UNLV stay on this composition, the Doomfist centered one. Lots of mobility, Five, lots four, of disruption play. Three, and they thrive in that chaos. The question is, can San Francisco respond in a way to quell it all, to corral them? We still got Throw the lasso on, so to speak. I'm done. They're having a race, but there isn't any Symmetra, so neither of them goes for the teleport. Instead, they're exchanging opening blows. Baguette's gonna dive right in, takes a whole lot of damage down to just double digits, and is finished off by Gordy. Hurts also, Gordy gets the Genji, Hertz finishes off Baguette, and then two more fall. Just about everyone from the team of San Fran is gone, and UNLV takes the point first. The JQ knife makes a Doomfist mobility go out the window if it's landed. It's a bit of a pain. J this composition that we have coming out from UNLV right now is a one of sustain. There's a the Genji get in, get out, stay alive, full attention. Whereas the side of University of San Francisco is going with the mirror comp from what we saw earlier on in map one, fully taking on UNLV's mantle of being the embodiment of chaos. And it looks like Omniflarp is going to be taking the brunt end of this chaos. Does not go down, but Pon uh, Ponky, as well as any of us both go down, his beat is dropped inside of UNLV. Oh man, Quirty is able to find the back line, takes out the helper. This is going to be the only one that can get away from that fight. That will most definitely pass 50% in the in the point charge or just nearing it. For the next fight, UNLV is going to be sitting on this rampage. Probably a beat and an overcut. Everything is above 75%. So we could be seeing a whole lot of cues pressed. When you know you're at the ultimate advantage, you need to get in and start the fight quick. We see Kitsune Rush beat is used in response. Forty comes in, gets the axe, does not find the elimination. Lucio skirts away to freedom. Here is the follow-up rampage. That's three down for the side of University of San Francisco, and Omniflarp goes down for the side of UNLV. Tracer's the last to fall. We are at 80% for UNLV capping here on second point, Night Market. Now is the time to get into the point, figure out who's gonna get first touch and who gets follow-up touch, because this is last fight territory for University of San Francisco. That was almost cinematic, the way Angst tried to get away and then just one Kuriko Knight ended that perfectly. Aimed. Here comes the Dragon Blade, it's gonna be brought out as well as a Katsune Rush Ooh. on the side of the Rebels. Envious is able to take out Omniflarp, now moves over to the point as San Fran is able to take it for themselves. The core unit decided to rotate to point. I think they actually went coastline to do it. We hear Beak get dropped, and then whomever was in front in main got sacrificed. Hey, Doggo is going to go to the Shadow Realm for a moment. That is the Kitiko gone for the side of UNLV. Baguette going to back off, wait for those cooldowns to come back online. We have first slam go down. The punch is well. Absorb is used. That's every cooldown on Doomfist. Cordy Tumor might engage after seeing everything get burned. Does. Takes down Baguette and is introing to point seeing Suzu get forced. 
Helper is also focused down by the Rebels. Now it's just pick up the pieces as Angst drops. Uses their ultimate to take out QWERTY, but that's going to do nothing in terms of the actual objective. Doof has managed to get back there. Baguette trying to hold out and wait for the team to respawn. Goes for a meteor strike. Needs to come back down in time. Is going to be able to. Kitsune rush to get the rest of San Fran on, but Flirty Tumor is just saying no to any of that. Takes out their tank. They got a little bit of everything gone now. Both their DPSs fight the dust. The last support is gone, and the Rebels view an LB lane. I have to give credit over to Agent. That's a pulse bomb onto the JQ. That does allow Doom just to find more value on point. No JQ shout means no extra speed boost. It means no extra health. We are going to see the play of the game go over to 40 on JQ here for Night Market. Got an assist on Baguette and then follows up taking down Anibis as well as Agent and Helper cleaned up. It's just Lucio running away trying to get a touch on point. But yes, I want to touch on that Tracer landing that Pulse Bomb onto JQ. It was huge. It allowed for the re everyone else to actually have the opportunity to intro onto point. It's just unfortunately the target focus wasn't where it needed to be. They didn't focus on forcing a cooldown and then eliminating somebody thereafter. Hopefully we see that come to fruition in the next map. But ultimately, they were showing that they are capable of taking UNLV on. It wasn't completely one-sided. They decided to, you know what, let's not try to face them head on. Let's make them come back to us and play around that instead. It worked out well. It's just unfortunately was not executed fast enough. Now Hybrid is on deck and I've just decided to not even entertain any ideas. If I just have low expectations, I'll be surprised. You know what I mean? I either have my expectations met or they're exceeded. Yeah, I mean, it's probably King's Row. Mm -hmm. I'm, I've given up really most hope on it not being King's, but I mean, Open Division was the one group. That is true. They brought out Eichenwald last time in the Open Division. So Open Division has given me hope, but I don't know if these two teams want to return that same hope yet again this evening to us. If they don't, I don't hold it against them. But if they do, I'll be forever thankful because I'm tired of King's Row. I mean, I get it. But on the same notion, aren't you getting a little bored too? We like to stir it up, you know? Add some flavor, some pizzazz, some zest. And you know what map has zestiness? I think Blizzard World has zestiness. There's color, there is sunshine, and it's a gorgeous map altogether. It is my dream Disney World I'd like to go to. At least let me see it in a video game. My rant is done. Those moments when you're going for an Emmy and yet you know you'll never get one. No, like, I just know it's gonna be King's Row. Production also likes to kind of prey on our desperation we're waiting. This map choice by flashing a map that isn't going to be chosen up on the monitor over here. No, I'm not uh, believing it. I'm not believing that. I'm not believing that. They're showing Blizzard. I'm not believing it until I see it, unless we actually get into yeah. game. Yeah. yeah. See? I know. I know so what they're trying to they do. So first they flash the Blizzard World map, and we're trying to tease us. They did that to us last week. We're not falling for it again. And it's, uh, we're loading into King's Row. But like I said, this was my expectation. You know, I set it, you know, to mm -hmm. this, and then I'm, yeah, I either have it met or I'm happy. Yeah, you know what? I'm taking your approach from here on out. We're just going to straight up, no predictions for second map. It is going to be King's Row rolling into hybrid. And if it's not King's Row, we can be pleasantly surprised. And overall, since San Fran was the one picking, they picked King's Row. So that leads me to believe that UNLV going to choose to attack first. I mean, if you want to go the route of what is the safest, what is the fastest, you always defend first if you get to map. If you don't get to pick map type, you always defend first. Mm. However, if you feel like it's going to be a very, very neck and, ga neck, and neck game and you oh, and it's going to, like, both teams, no matter what, are going to send us into overtime, you're getting all three points, then you attack first. And so it's kind of a matter of how much that they, you know, respect San Fran at this point. It's not just that. It is... a level of understanding of what you're about to go up against. There are teams that have come up with, granted, yes, not in Overwatch 2, in Overwatch 1, some of the most grotesque compositions and things to do on King's Row, which is also why I like to avoid it, because we don't see the same level of creativity anymore, because we don't have a second tank. Yes, I'm going to grieve the loss of my two tanks. Without that, I feel like there isn't as much excitement on King's Row, but it is scrimmed into the ground, into oblivion, streamed into oblivion. 
So everyone knows what their options are and knows how to make swaps. It just stinks on defense because if your enemy rolls out on attack on a tank that is the counter to your tank, you have no choice but to die and walk all the way back from the Omnic factory. Whereas on attack, you see a tank that's not the right tank you want to go up against, you walk back in and you're like, hey, we're swapping it up. We haven't seen too much of that factory. In case, you know, in terms of team throw being all or nothing, it's been mostly nothing as teams that have defended first have held it to the first point more often than not. That's enough, Arthur. Today, I'm saying that that's not the a trend throughout the whole game because a lot of times we see it going to the final point. But just today, it's been a lot of sweeps and a lot of holes. And it looks like we have the side of University of San Francisco on attack first. It's going to be the J Cube composition with the Sojourn Genji as well as the Kiko Lucio. And it looks like Genji's going to go down to Hertz from UNLV. Side of UNLV is going, uh, showing similar composition, but the caveat being a Zarya from 40. They're just moving in past the choke point first. He's going to pick one up onto Aang. Squirty Humor follows it up by eliminating Baguette. They're going to chase him back into the spawn. We've okay. seen this before. Good to see you. Squirty Tumor is going to give up the area around the bus okay. and go back to the choke point. Don't want to be too far forward because you need space to back off and run away if you get your bubbles popped too quickly or get too low on health. So being too far forward on Zarya can be a little bit of a feeding position if you're a tank player. We have Baguette rotate through Hotel. Does not get pressed until it's fully outside. Suzu is forced. Shout looks like it was used by Baguette. Baguette gets deleted by Cordy. We do see Sojourn looking for the Zarya. Cannot find the headshot. Cordy gets three. And that is a reset for the side of University of San Francisco. Hertz is sitting on this blade. Probably doesn't even need the nano boost to be able to pull that one out. Okay. Now we are going to see just how soon he wants to use it in this engage. Some opening barbs traded between each two teams. See if San Fran still hasn't pushed past the choke. It's going to be held at bay with that soldier in Molly. I think University of San Francisco is aware that Hertz is very close to Blade. They managed to delete him first anyway. We do have the helper find, uh, be able to take down the immortality field as well, but they're, I think they're waiting for Honky on the beat and said, hey, Doggo sees the opportunity to stabilize the entirety of their team, drops the beat, two go down for the side of University of San Francisco, it's another reset. UNLV is just building up the ultimate advantage. They're up to four now. Somniflar comes online with that overclock. University of San Fran might have a blade, probably gonna have a beat for this fight. But overall, they just can't match the abilities that UNLV, the Rebels, are gonna have. But they've only got a minute left. They gotta push on. They go charging in. They start with the overclock and the window, UNLV, to hold the point. San Fran uses the beat, but all that damage being pushed oh. out by the Rebels is too much. Just really hoping to see on the floor, wait for the deflect, and then just hop the overclock. Unfortunately, they waited a little bit too long, so deflect came right back. Hurts still hanging onto this blade, has not used it. What are you waiting on? You know, I said he might not need, he doesn't even need nano boost to make it work. He might not even just need the blade to make it work. Gets a little bit of deflect damage, Ooh. moves in, is gonna stop. He pulls out the blade and oh. just deletes Helper. Moves in, Envious tried to get away, but just one slash of the blade and he's gone. Vegas using Rampage, the rest of the team turns around, focuses down the tank. And there goes, I think, the last chance San Fran had. Making it on to the point. They'll get one more team fight, but they have one less ultimate. This might actually be better since UNLV expended everything. Honky might be able to get in and get a touch with the follow switch step, switch step from Kiriko to get contact on point. They manage to make it nice. in. They get Hey Doggo. Down goes Kern Master as well. When you burn every ultimate in the game and go to neutral fight, and people are in desperation mode to get control. They will follow through. Zarya's low, Sojourn's low. Sojourn slides away, but this Zarya is high charged. They need to get rid of Cordy. 
Unfortunately, two go down to Omniflar and Cordy because they lacked picking the target to delete and splitting the focus off the point. 95.8% capture for University of San Francisco. Ah, attention is a resource and if you split it between two people, it gets really difficult for one to go away. So we're not even gonna see the payload this time. It's just a matter of getting the first point for the Rebels and they will have taken game two and move on to match point. This was the best, you know, you gotta hand it to Angst. Trying everything, it's just, you, splitting up the team would normally be a good thing. It's just, like you said, Nerdy, they were just trying to, you know, take both out at once. Sojourn you slide. Okay, it's really far to get after the Sojourn. Zarya doesn't have that mobility. One person stays on, typically Lucio. Everyone else goes and chases down that Zarya. Cordy was like 75 health, if not lower. They're gonna see it in the bottom view. It doesn't look like there's too much changing in terms of DPSs, but we do see maybe they're just doing a bit of scouting. Certainly waiting for the last possible moment to get to the point. Remember, and we see a horse be brought out. This, this makes me happy. This is the side of University of San Francisco on defense. They've got to basically full hold this. Yes, you can lose some people. One of the plays you can do is if you lose essential heroes, Early on, you back off, you give them two ticks, and you wait, and you come back. But you have to perfectly execute that and pray they don't have a mag. Well, UNLV doesn't have a mag. Instead, looks like Birdie is going to be going on to the Doom yet again. And Antine is going to hit two from University of San Fran. And Ponky falls soon, soon afterwards. Hanks also sustaining a lot of damage. Antine goes on to Envious. They yes. still manage to survive. Birdie is eliminated with the tank on. Hanks can take out the back line of UNLV. Kern yes. is going to fall. And Omniflorp also falls. Yes, Baguette. There's just one left on the point. It's Hurts. And now the tank is here, forcing you off. Oh, but the response coming from the rebels. The immortality, well, the, the anti onto the horse. If only Orisa had lived a little bit longer. This retake might be easier. And it looks like UNLV is going to walk away with a 1 0 on King's Row. Going to make it 2 and 0 overall in the match. Play of the game recognition, giving over to QWERTY as Zarya, of course. When she's charged up, she's charged up, although here, yeah, bubble bring up to 43, not even past 50%, but still doing enough damage to get player. All right. I Are we have, betting on red I have or black? failed at this <laughs> every time tonight. What? You know what? I'm flipping it. Normally the host does this. What map do you think we're going to play for Flashpoint, Jacob? New Junk City. I'm going to take your place. Because if you swap, and it actually is Servasta, I, I have to be the one on the other side to take it at the very last moment. You know what? I commend you. I personally would love to see New Junk City. Is that going to happen? I don't know. I'm not saying it's going to be New Junk. I'm not putting it out in the universe. I'm not going to follow that. Not, I'm hearing noises that have me concerned <laughs> from production right now. That's all I can say. I don't know where this is going. We're going to Flashpoint right now. UNLV is at series point. If they win for Flashpoint, that's it. We're done. Everyone gets to home, go home and go to sleep. However, if University of San Francisco has been practicing this, knows what map they want, knows what they want to run, figures out how they're going to counter UNLV, wins out on Flashpoint, regardless of what map it is, we're gonna be going into push. So nonetheless, it's the, we either continue the story from here, but that is up to University of San Francisco. If not, UNLV walks away with a victory on Flashpoint and, and everyone from NACE, we can go, you know, lights out, hydrate, get some sleep, do your homework, and we'll see you again next week. But we'll have to wait and see, of course. And there's just, I, I hear laughing, I hear possibly sounds of pain from production. <laughs> Which could go two ways. I know, because it's like, are they on our side right now and are fine with going to New Junk City? Or, I don't know, I really don't know.
Is the pain from having to see Sirvasa again? Is the pain from having to see New Jersey? This could go either way. These people have toyed with us so much when it comes to second map that I just can't trust anything beyond control points. I get it, but hmm, I don't know. Man, I'm still just trying to work out the mentals of production. And I'm just finding myself going in circles, going to double, you know, reverse psychology, then double reverse psychology, then triple reverse psychology. This 50-50 shot is proving to be one of the most stressful decisions that I am having to make, but I'm still gonna stick on New Junk City. I don't know how it can be 50-50 between two maps, especially because last week it was it's all <laughs> New Junk City, all New Junk. There was no Cervaza, and then this week, Everyone's like, flipped the coin, flipped the switch, I don't know, and they're like, new junk sucks, we're it's, going to Sarasa. It's kind of like when you're plugging in a USB cable. I mean, technically there's a 50-50 shot, but you always put it in the wrong way first. For me, it's like it exists in the third dimension. I put it in wrong the first time, and then I flip it, and it still doesn't go in, and That's then I true. flip it back, and then somehow the first way I did it is actually the right way. So I don't get it, or just... That's our experience, trying to choose a flashpoint. Exactly, it's like trying to put USB into a charging port. Flashpoint, we have two map options. We have successfully guessed wrong every single time. I even confused Matt because I told him last week that, you know, everyone went new junk. And this week, and then he was like, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to vote for new junk. And then he's like, wait a minute, no, I'm going to Cervasa. And I stuck to my guns on new junk. City. I made a mistake. Well, last week we only actually saw one Flashpoint stage. Uh, so I think it was the week before that everyone went new junk to start things out. And then when we started broadcasting, the only Flashpoint uh, stage was Cervasa. So we haven't seen a broadcast in this studio where New Junk City has been brought out. Write a new Either story. that trend is gonna be, no! Initiating ah! match. Oh! Oh man, okay, Jacob, I think we just need to stop asking the question of the 50-50 coin toss and actually getting like, I don't know, a foam coin in here and flipping it and being like, heads is Cervasa, tails is new junk. I don't and think that's, that's I don't think event. that's gonna change anything. No, but it so. means it's not leaving it up to either one of us to be wrong. That's true. All right, back to old tried and true. Ready for Ugh, I get it. Hopefully we get introduced to more Flashpoint options as the time goes on, because two Flashpoint maps, I get it, they're massive. That's just not enough options. You don't really have to speculate, though. No. Five, At least one four, thing that to speculate three, on which teams are on attack and defense. We don't one. have to do that now, so the less things we have to speculate Initial on, the less chances we have to do Baguette one is choosing to go with two fist and also right. hitting the one punch bad voice lines. I'm here for it. Both teams just exchanging a few shots back and forth. Group that goes in from UNLV. It's going to be quickly forced back. Hey, Doggo just picking up one onto Bonky. Hurts also eliminating the helper. Baguette falls. UNLV goes for the team wipe, trying to find Angst. He's trying to get away. Come on, Angst. Hey, Doggo is just doing work on the Ana, I gotta say. I, I mean, she's no rid Widowmaker, but the way Anx is playing, you would think so. Ana is both powerful. The sh she and herself is like a glass cannon. And you become the glass cannon when you position too far forward. You don't have line of sight on your exit. You aren't aware that there's a tank staring you down because if a tank is staring you down, odds are you need to run away. Oh! <laughs> but when Hey Doggo can land the sleep. Or, or you could just shoot the tank with a sleep dart. Oh, well, Hey Doggo also is in the shadow realm for a moment, so that is the exact situation that I say on as a glass cannon. Nades are powerful, however, there's a Suzu. Then their team needs to follow up. If you're not looking and you get jumped on, by a TP, a Doomfist, or anything, and you don't have a way out because you waited too long, well, you're in hot water. Right now, it is still UNLV's control at the point. You're encroaching on last fight if the side of University of San Francisco can make it back in. Omniflarp is the only one with an ult online. Anx is getting very close to matching the Pulse Bomb, however. Yes, it's online now. It's Pulse Bomb v Pulse Bomb. Whoever ults first is what I always say. One touch onto the point, and it's quickly negated as everyone who gets on the point is just 
melted down by the rebels. UNLV picks up the first flashpoint. Now moving on to the second. Ah, uh, this is where things get scary. We saw many people take a trip off the edge of this point of the map. Hopefully we don't see that here. Going in this next fight, we have Roughly Beat online for UNLV as well as Meteor Strike and Blade Nano soon to follow. Meteor Strike almost fully charged for University of San Francisco. Kitsune Rush and Pulse Bomb will be, there, will be up. Hey, Doggo goes down to Tracer. Hertz responds with the blade, does find Ponky. And we see Pulse Bomb land on nobody. Ooh. The Rhino both teams are tied. Genji goes down. Hertz goes off the map, equalizing. It's, this is an opportunity right now for University of San Francisco. Unfortunately, they have no supports. So that's going to make things really difficult. And Agent does, uh, Angst does go down, so point capture to UNLV. Thing is, for the Dons, they're a little bit more offensively positioned. They at least have the engage with the Kitsune Rush. They also got a Meteor Strike. Question is, when will you have an NLB play that beat so they can help engage that damage? Most likely in response is Kitsune oh, they Rush just and losing yeah. your Ana. But I don't know if it's enough. The Meteor Strike comes Come on, down and QWERTY is just moving on into the squishies. Come on, Baguette! Hurts is down. Okay, we, we leave the Lucio. Yeah, he's well ready for freedom. I get it. QWERTY takes out Angst. Omniflarp gets a punch on to help her. Two left for the Dons, Baguette. Gets sleep darted. Honky goes down there. now, just Baguette. Cool. And Genji decides to go into the drink, realizing it's a full reset. Most likely, we don't see another scrimmage here on point. And we just wait it out for the next trend, next point to unlock. But Tracer has decided to go in. Angst gets the touch, doesn't find recall fast enough. Beats dropped on point. Suze Nano is used from the side of UNLV, looking to secure the second flash point as Helper goes down, Baguette goes down, and Ponky. Second flash point, a done deal for the Rebels. Now they just need one more and they'll win the match. We have Cordy Timmer going in with Meteor Strike on lock. Omniflarp has that pul pulse bomb. Angst does as well. We have the Genji Blade online for the University of San Francisco. No support ults for either side. But Lucio is the closest from UNLV as far as those go. Baguette, 80% on this Meteor Strike charge. Recall is going to be forced out from Omniflarp. Hopefully someone starts going after that Tracer. Pulse Bomb has been burned. No one has gone just yet. And it will be Cordy, first one to get eliminated. Hey, Doggo will find any of this as well. So equalize. But the team that's hurting the most right now is UNLV. They don't have Cordy Tumor. They find Lucio there after from University of San Francisco. Hey, Doggo goes down. The helper goes down. Bodies are hitting the floor left and light, right. Baguette, just a sliver of health gets eliminated on point, And UNLV will claim, will capture and start ticking up that percentage. Got to think that there's going to be possibly one last true push from San Fran on this. The fact that the ultimates, I think this 2-1 matchup might just be the best that they're going to have in terms of ultimates. At the end of this, UNLV is probably going to be online with their other three. So beat her now, and you can take out this Lucio really fast, but the beat is used in response to the Dragon Blade. Hertz still manages to pick up one against Ponky and Envious. Hey, Doggo is taken out by Baguette. The UNLV is making the elimination stack up. There's just two left, and Baguette is very low on health. Angst also taking a chunk of damage. Birdie moving in to gain space on the point. UNLV has one fight left, or if they can drag this one out, they'll just cruise right on into victory. In these situations where I have believed University of San Francisco would not get the opportunity to make contact at the point, they prove me wrong every time. Here they come. They've claimed it, pushing into the enemy Whoa. territory. Kitsune rushing into the back line, leaving one on, saying, you get the cab, they get the flip. Percentages going up in their favor. They do lose their Lucio, but they find Hey Doggo. This is their opportunity to rally back. Unfortunately, they have lost their Kiriko as well. The back line's getting traded. And it looks like now is an opportunity for the rest of UNLV to come back in and start cleaning up what remains of University of San Francisco. Overtime clock ticks down. And that is going to do it for this match. The Rebels claim 
Another 3-0 sweep, so not quite the competitive match that we saw in the Open Division last week. UNLV in this end as soon as it can. Play of the game is going to be given over to Ward Hertz. Turn on this Genji. Pops Blade finds the Lucio, finds Genji. Hey, Dago goes down, so that's another kill that needs to be secured, and it's Omniflor can find it. With that, UNLV is our champions here for our last NACE game of the evening. It is the last NACE game, but the fun just doesn't end because we have an interview with one of the players coming up. So we are going to take a short break, get one of those players into our call, ask him about the last match, and then we'll close it out for the evening. But for now, stay tuned. We'll have an interview right after this. Hurts get forced back with the Spear Spin and Spear. Both cooldowns, all three cooldowns from Baguette have been used. Ooh. Confirms the deletion of Keen Master. Now it does look like the poor, poor Bassy on their team is gone. Hey, Doggo gets deleted. And it looks like they just gave up too much. Taking on UNLV's mantle of being the embodiment of chaos. And it looks like Omniflarp is going to be taking the brunt end of this chaos. Does not go down. But Pon uh, Ponky, as well as any of us, both go down. If he just drops inside of UNLV. Oh man, Flurry is able to find the back line. Takes out. Through Hotel, does not get pressed until it's fully outside. Suzu is forced. Shout looks like it was used by Baguette. Baguette gets deleted by Cordy. We do see Sojourn looking for the Zarya. Cannot find the headshot. Cordy gets three. And that is a reset for the side of He might not need, he doesn't even need nano boost to make it work. He might not even just need the blade to make it work. Gets a little bit of deflect damage. Oh. Moves in, is gonna stop. He pulls out the blade. Oh! Just elite helper moves in. Envious tried to get away, but just one slash of the blade, and he's gone. Vegas using Rampage. The rest this might actually be better since UNLV expended everything. Ponky might be able to get in and get a touch with the follow switch step, switch step from Kiriko to get contact on point. They managed to make it nice. in. They get Hey Doggo. Down goes Kern Master as well. When you burn every ultimate in the game and go to neutral fight and keep hey Doggo just picking up one onto Ponky. Hurts also eliminating the oh. helper bag at falls. When LV goes for the team wipe, trying to find Angst, who's trying to get away. Come on, Angst. Come on. Oh. Hey, Doggo is just doing work on the online, gotta say. Hey, Doggo goes down to Tracer. Hertz responds with the blade, does find Ponky. And we see Pulse Bomb land on nobody. Ooh. Right now, both teams are tied. Genji goes down. Hertz goes off the map, equalizing. It, this is an opportunity right now for University of San Francisco. Unfortunately, they have no supports. So that's going to make fine. Any of this as well. So equalize. But the team that's hurting the most right now is UNLV. They don't have 40 Tumor. They find Lucio there after from University of San Francisco. Hey, Doggo goes down. The helper goes down. Bodies are hitting the floor left and light, right. Baguette, just a sliver of health gets eliminated on point, And UNLV will claim you get the cab. They get the flip. Percentage is going up in their favor. They do lose their Lucio, but they find Hey Doggo. This is their opportunity to rally back. Unfortunately, they have lost their Kiriko as well. The back line's getting traded. And it looks like now is an opportunity for the rest of UNLV to come back in and start cleaning up what remains of the university. to the Nay Star League studio. We are wrapping up all four of our matches that we have had today for Overwatch in both varsity and open divisions. We just have one interview left with the team that was most, was most recently victorious, UNLV. We got their tank 40 with us to talk a few things about the match that just transpired. I'm Jeff Palmer, joined by Artemis Rain. We have been talking a lot with players today. It's great to just kind of get to that feedback right after a game, and I'm sure we just want to jump in with the team. You also shouted out uh, with their with their uh, jersey. I'll bring that up just a little bit later. But right now, we'll see if we can't get QWERTY on into the studio and just talk a little bit about uh, what, uh, what 
just an amazing sweep that they pulled off. I mean, the Doomfist pick is powerful. What else can you say? I mean, if you talk to some people, you'll be like, yes. Oh, here we go. Great oh my God. <laughs> I think, I think uh, Nerdy approves of the background. I do, I do, 100%, yes. <laughs> Well, it's nice to have you uh, here with us, QWERTY. Um, I do believe, actually, there's an audio issue for us. We're just waiting to see if the speaker comes up so we can hear you. Hello? Hello. There, there we, we go. go. Thank okay, you. Okay. okay, there you are. OK, QWERTY, I, I'm going to ask you the first question, and I'm just going to, because you didn't have the choice of stage last uh, for Flashpoint. But if you had choice of stage for Flashpoint, what would you have chosen? Would you have gone uh, with the same, Sarvasa? We, we, would have, we wouldn't have done New Junk City. We would have done the same one. Of course! Of course! No, no, one, no one likes New Junk! It's just... It's just. <laughs> it, it's weird. For the, first, for the first week, it was all New Junk, and then ever since we started broadcasting, everyone's <laughs> just been going the other way, so... Uh, it's, it's, it, it's, it's not a bad map, but it's just... Um, I think you have such a better time like with tighter angles and so much like point diversity on uh, Suravasa, where Junk City is just so open all the time. Okay, that's fair. So going away from Flashpoint, because this has been the bane of both of our evenings, we suck at <laughs> guessing maps apparently. Uh, for Li Jing, second point, Night Market, you did not guess wrong on what tank you, I think at least, what tank you thought University of San Francisco was going to roll out on. So my question is to you, were you anticipating Baguette to go Doomfist and therefore you decided, nah, I'm just going to come out on JQ and, you know, knife and axe the entire back line into oblivion? Uh, honestly, it sounds a little, like, bad, but I, we didn't really consider what they were doing. Um, I, if I'm allowed to play Doom Map, I'll play Doom Map, but we've been trying to get a little bit more incorporated on, like, the better meta characters and the better picks to, like, kind of roll through and uh, we did a lot of practice with Junker Queen and I know the meta is shifting a little bit right now but uh, we just wanted to play what we were comfortable on and really just like show that we can get better and be a pretty dominant force nonetheless. All right well it's starting to get late in the night so we'll get you out on this node. Nerdy earlier on gave a shout out uh, to uh, Hey Doggo is uh, held up the jersey that we still have as a souvenir from UNLV so <laughs> in the spirit of giving shout outs to people is there anyone you want to give a shout out to? Um, I just shout out to everyone on the team. I think they did a uh, phenomenal. Um, the fact that you guys have a Hey Dogo's jersey is really funny to me because he still has the Boise jersey. He holds it up. He's like, "Yeah, I'm, I'm for Boise." And we're like, "Why don't you support us?" You know. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but it, it's still a, a fun little time. And just shout out to everyone on the team who did great. All right, congrats on your win. Thank you for joining us. We'll let you get going. Uh, and thank you that so much. is going. Thank you. And. That is going to do it for our broadcast. We want to give a thank you to everyone in production, all the players who have joined us. Of course, thank you to you all, to you who are watching out there on Twitch and other streaming platforms right now. I also want to give a very special shout out to Truth, Extra Life, Duncan, Monster, and Odyssey Elixir for being our sponsors. That's going to do it for us tonight, but just to relive the glory one more time, we'll leave you with the top five plays of the game. So thank you for watching. We'll see you tomorrow with Valorant and next week if you want to join us for more Overwatch 2. But for now, so long. So Archway was clean without spending anything. There is an Ant Matrix in the corner. This one street lit way. Very short. Maybe back off. Wait a few moments. No ground to see. The boss from Juice. Has to pass the board. They get caught in a grab. Ooh. And the core bolt and the bolt four comes through. Taking on UNLV. Mantle of being the embodiment of chaos. And it looks like Omniflarp is going to be taking the front end of this chaos. Does not go down. The pwn, uh, Punky as well as any of the bolts down to keep it from the side of the Alright, Kentucky doesn't get anyone, but does a lot of damage needs.
fall. The robot is pushing forward ever so slightly. They just need four meters and it's overtime. Butters and Clario also get an elimination. The turret oh. is taken down. The torque goes down. There's just the Junker Queen left. And Kentucky, have they won it in over? Rest of the Spain. Moving in the side route now. He's going to have to time this right. That's both bubbles used by the Zarya. One, if they're making sure they're playing around those cooldowns, it is a green light for Kabushki to just do have it. He brings out the Death Blossom, picks up the Kuriko squeak.